And uh, we have a pretty large agenda tonight. And so um, I want to say ahead, thank you for your patience um, as we get to um, all of the items. The commissioners and I really appreciate y'all being here. So let's go ahead and get started on our agenda. Uh, we're on item B, the adoption of the agenda. Has everyone, have all the commissioners looked through the agenda? <coughs> we need a motion to adopt. There's been a motion to adopt and a second. second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And the agenda is adopted. That is in front of you. Item C, which is our... Uh, well, hold on one second. And so we'll need um, item C, which is the approval of the January 12th minutes. Uh, has everybody reviewed those that have been sent to you in advance? We'll need it now. The January 12th. The approval of the January 12th, 2017 minutes. So the staff is still reviewing those and we'll send them out electronically after this meeting. So okay. we had moved them to the next meeting. Good deal. Mic's off. Okay. <clears throat> Good deal. So we will do the minutes next meeting correct yeah. okay so we'll do the january 12th minutes next meeting so we are on to item c which is the recognition of the council members and so how i just uh, there's a lot of council members i thought the entire council came down tonight but um, which we appreciate um so i i go by uh with the council members that i i see first just to be fair um and so the first <laughs> first person i saw and walked in with was council lady mina Johnson, you want to go first, or you guys can wait until your item comes up, but if you want to come on up, come on up, Council Lady. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Mina Johnson, representing Council District 23, Bellmead, Westmead, uh, Hillwood area. Uh, I am uh, speaking on today on the item number 5A and 5B, which is uh, Nashville Highland SP amendment. Uh, currently, it is consent agenda. So I believe it will be still remain on the consent agenda, as far as I know. And But uh, this is uh, SP to amend shopping center uh, existing gas station retail to allow uh, multi-housing residential unit or assisted living unit. And we did work with our planning staff and property owner and also the resident behind that proposed shopping center part of change, which is the Eagle Ridge uh, condominium. All of them are engaged. And particularly, I would like to thank your planning staff on the hard work. They suggested great language to protect uh, Slope Hill and yet still allow uh, the development, or which is future development, because this SP is still conceptual SP. We do not have any development proposal right now, so we used our imagination uh, at maxima to see if and when uh, we do have a development, what kind of a development will be appropriate. So we still serve uh, reserve property rights, yet we have maximum protection for the environment and neighborhood. So for that, I would like to thank uh, planning staff for the hard work, and also I would like to thank the property owner's representative, uh, Sean Henry and his farm. Uh, they uh, were very considerate of the neighborhood and agreed every single condition neighbor was presented. And of course, as a neighborhood, see the open space it's so hard that will be someday eventually turn into housing. You know, we all love green space and open space, but I think overall uh, this proposed SP is the best of the all, you know, all world. So I would love for you to approve a staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. We appreciate it. And it is on the consent agenda so far. It's not been pulled off. Uh, next, Council Member Nick Leonardo. I saw him. There he is. Hi, Council. You, you want to wait? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. 
Thank you, Councilman. I saw Councilman Swope. Where's he at? There. Yes, sir. Nice bow tie today. You got to put on a tie every now and again. Um, for those of you who don't know, Robert Swope, Council District 4, Brentwood, Nippers Corners area. Um, I've got several things on your agenda tonight. The 621 Hill Road, Granbury Estate, I'm asking you to defer it to the 9th of February. We're going to have one more community meeting on it. Um, I think the plan that has come back now is pretty responsible, and, but I want the neighbors a chance to see it, talk to the developers um, before we bring it to you guys. Um, item number 13 on your agenda is the Deadman property. Hold on one second, Council. We want to get the right number, make sure we... I'm sorry. Hold on one second. What number is it? <coughs> Is it maybe 7A and B? No, I'm coming to 26. I think the staff recommendation is already. The first one that uh, the councilman just spoke about is 20, item number 27. And you want to defer item 27? Let me see if we get to Yes. That. Right. We uh, put it on the deferral list for February 9th. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Next. Okay. Item number 13 is the Deadman Property Subdivision Amendment. This is nothing more than redefining notes 7 and 8, and I ask you that you do that per the staff recommendation. Um, item number 26, 2017-578, is one of my preemptive zonings. Uh, that I've done for the El Shaddai Christian Church. Uh, this is a 141-year-old church. It sits at the corner of uh, Nolansville Road and Concord. It sits in a floodplain due to the new FEMA maps, and as a consequence, if we put it under a historical landmark overlay, they can actually restore the church, which is all they want to do. Um, I ask that you pass this so that they can restore their church and continue their services. And thank you very much for all your service. That's on consent. Thank you, Councilman. Thanks. Councilman Pulley, I saw. I'm gonna wait, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. <coughs> Councilman Rosenberg, I saw. You gonna wait? Okay, thank you, Councilman. Councilman Syracuse, you wanna wait too? All right. We'll give you all two minutes. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <coughs> no, I'm joking. Um, Councilman Haywood, Brenda. Please. You'll pass. You'll wait. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Did I miss any other councilman? I want to make sure we get get everyone. I'll get I'll get yelled at by Councilman. I want to make, okay. So we got everybody. All right. We're on item D. Items for deferral and withdrawal. Bob. Okay, we do have several items for deferral and withdrawal, starting with item 1A, case 2016-CP-002-001. This is a request to amend the Parkwood Union, Union Hill Community Plan on a portion of property located at 4045 Dickerson Pike, and the staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. The uh, associated zone change with that one is case 1B, Case number, or item 1B, case 2016 SP-089-001. This is a request to rezone from CS and RS-20 to SP zoning for property located at 4045 Dickerson Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Uh, next item is item 2, case 2016-Z-024-TX-001. This is a request to amend Chapter 17.04, 1720, and 1740 of the Metropolitan Code pertaining to sidewalks. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 4, case 2007 SP-150-001. This is a request to amend a previously approved SP for properties located at 1209 and 1213 Tulip Grove Road to permit up to 340 residential units. Um, staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item six, case 2016 SP-083-001. 
This is a request to rezone from ORI zoning to SP zoning on property located at 50 Music Square West to permit a hotel and restaurant. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting. And I will note on that item that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself. Next and item. Bob, I'm, I'm going to recuse myself on okay. the item 6. Thank you. Next item is item 7A. Uh, case 2016 SP-090-001. This is a request to rezone from MUN and OL zoning to SP zoning on properties located at Old Hickory Boulevard to permit a self-service storage facility. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th meeting. And then the associated case with that one is 7B, case 2004P-021-003. This is a request to cancel a portion of a planned unit development overlay district on property located at Old Hickory Boulevard. This was, uh, these two items are in Councilman Swope's district. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th meeting. Next item on the, the deferral list is item, uh, Case or item eight, case 2016 SP-095-001. This is a request to rezone from OR20 and R6 to SP zoning on properties located at Clay Street, Dominican Drive, and Fourth Avenue North to permit a hotel. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Uh, next item is item 12, case 2017. S-009-001. This is a request for final plat approval to shift lot lines and remove a reserve status on property located at Perimeter Hill Drive and Antioch Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting. And I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself on item 12. Next item is item 13, case 2017 s 010-001. This is a request for sub, a subdivision amendment approval um, for property located at 5959 Edmonton Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 14, case 2016-Z-135-PR-001. This is a request to rezone from IG to MULA zoning on property located at 93 Taylor Street. And the staff recommendation is to withdraw. Next item is item 15, case 2016-CP-005-005. This is a request to amend the East Nashville Community Plan by adding a special policy area allowing trail-oriented oriented development. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 18. Um, case 2016 SP-060-001. This is a request to rezone from R6 to SP zoning for property located at 2021 12th Avenue North to, per to permit up to four residential units. And the staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Next item is item 19, case 2017 SP-004-001. This is a request to rezone from R6 and R8 to SP zoning on property located at 6124 Robertson Avenue and Robertson Avenue unnumbered to permit up to 12 multifamily dwelling units. Staff recommends to defer indefinitely. And I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself on item number 19. Next item on the deferral list is item 20, case 2017 SP-007-001. This is a request to rezone from R8 to SP zoning on property located at 6015 and 6017 O'Brien Avenue to permit up to nine residential units. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 21, case 2017 SP-007. 011-001, a request to rezone from R6 and SP zoning on property located at 504 and 506 Southgate Avenue to permit up to nine residential units. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 9th Planning Commission meeting. Next item, item 24A, case 2017 SP-001. 
uh, 017-001. This is a request to rezone from R20 and RM4 zoning to SP zoning on property located at Old Hickory Boulevard to permit residential uses and include uh, environmentally sensitive and environmentally sensitive design standards within the SP staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Commission meeting the associated planned unit development is item 24 B which is case 66 84p-002 this is a request to cancel a portion of a planned unit development district on property located at Old Hickory Boulevard. This is in uh, Council Lady Mina Johnson's district. This is a staff, staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 27, case 2017 HL-003-001. This is a request for a historic landmark overlay district on a portion of property located at 621 a Hill Road staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting next item on the def deferral list is uh, item 28 case 2017 uh, NHC-001-001 this is a request to apply a neighborhood conservation overlay district on various properties along uh, Hillview Heights Cisco Street and Inverness Avenue Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 29, case 2017 S-012-001. This is a request for final plat approval to create three lots on property located at 1227 Old Hickory Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th Planning Commission meeting. And those are all the items on the, the deferral list. Thank you, Bob. Just for a clarification, I also I need to recuse myself from item number six and item number eight. And we'll go through this really slow. So the items for deferral withdrawal are items 1A, 1B, 2, 4, 6, 7A, 7B, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, 18, 19, 20, 21, 24A, 24B, 27, 28, and 29. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Commissioners, you've heard the motions for deferral withdrawal. Is the items for referral withdrawal, is there any discussion? Or is there a motion? There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And those items will be deferred or withdrawal. We are on item E, which is now the consent agenda, Bob. Okay, uh, before I get to the consent agenda, as information for our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60, 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. Please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. And as notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. So as I read the following items uh, into the record, please raise your hand if you'd like one of these items removed from the consent agenda. Starting with uh, item number 5A, case 2016 SP-081-001. This is a request to rezone from SCN zoning to specific plan zoning for property located at Old Hickory Boulevard unnumbered to permit a multifamily uh, residential development with a maximum of 50 units or an assisted living care facility with a maximum of 150 rooming units. And the staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The associated case is 5B, case 95P-009-001. This is a request for cancellation of a planned unit development overlay district on property at Old Hickory Boulevard. This is uh, in Mina Johnson's, the Council Lady Mina Johnson's district. And staff recommendation is to approve if the associated zone change is approved and disapprove if the associated zone change is not approved. Next item, item nine, is case 2016 SP-098-001. 
This is a request to rezone from specific plan zoning to a new specific plan zoning district on property located at 910 and 912 North 2nd Street to per permit uses limited to uh, one single family or one two family unit per parcel. Two family units shall be fully connected and shall appear as one unit. The staff recommendation is to disapprove case uh, 2016Z019PR-001, which is Council Bill 2016-449, and defer case 2016SP-098-001 to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 11, case 2016S-255-001. This is a request for final plat approval to create four lots on property located at 2686 Hartford Drive. Staff recommendation is to approve the variance request and approve the plat with conditions. Next item is item 16, case 2017Z-002TX-001. This is uh, a request to amend section 17.40060 of the Metro Zoning Code to allow members of the Metropolitan Council to initiate applications to amend the official zoning map of property owned by the Metropolitan Government. The staff recommendation is, uh, the staff is recommending that the Planning Commission make no recommendation to the Council on this item. Next item is item 17. Uh, case 2016 SP-047-002. This is a request to amend a portion of the Douglas and Lishy specific plan district on property located at 1300 Lishy Avenue to permit up to 16 residential dwelling units and 3,800 3, square feet of retail and office space. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And I'll note on that on item 17 that Commissioner McLean is recusing himself. Next item is item 26, case 2017 HL-001-001. This is a request for a historic landmark overlay district on property located at uh, 10604 Concord Road, and the staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is item 30A, case 2017Z-007PR-001. This is a request to rezone from OR20 to R15 zoning on property located at 2203, 2205A, and 2207 Pennington Bend Road. Staff recommendation is to approve, and the associated PUD cancellation is item 30B, Case 48-83P-002. This is a request for cancellation of a, a planned unit development overlay district on property located at 2203, 2205A, and 2207 Pennington Bend Road. And the staff recommendation is to approve subject to the approval of the associated zone change and disapprove if the associated zone change is not approved. Next items, item 32, case 2017Z-012PR-001. This is a request to apply a contextual overlay district on various properties along Gray Bar Lane. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is item 33, uh, case 2017Z-013PR-001. This is a request to rezone from R10 to RS10 zoning on various properties along Gray Bar Lane. Staff recommendation is to disapprove, disapprove as submitted, but approve with a substitute ordinance to remove all parcels containing legal duplexes from the zone change. Next item is item 34, case 2017Z-016PR-001. This is a request to rezone from RS5 to RM20A zoning on property located at 2800 Delaware Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. And next item is item 36, case 2005P-008-009. This is a request to revise the preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for a portion of a PUD overlay district at 7996 Highway 100 to permit a restaurant. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions, and I will note on, on item 36 that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself. And then under other business, Item 37 is our contract renewals for uh, Patrick Napier, Deborah Sullivan, and Craig Owensby, and recommend approval. And item 39, 
is a memorandum of, of agreement between Smart Growth America and the, Met, and the Metro uh, Nashville MPO for the integration of public health into the transportation planning process. Staff recommendation is to approve. And the last item is item 43, accept the director's report and approve administrative items. And I will note that Commissioner Diaz is recusing herself on the director's report. And those are all the items. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I, I need to, uh, for a personal note, I need to recuse myself from item 36. Why don't you go over the list one more time? Okay. That way we can make sure we have them all. Okay, the items on the consent uh, list are items uh, 5A, 5B, 9, 11, 16, 17, 26, 30A, 30B, 32, 33, 34, 36, 37, 39, and 43. And I can, I can list the ones that, that we will hear if you would like me to. Yes, that would be perfect. Well, okay. Well, oh, wait one second. Our director. If you will actually... While that list is still fresh in everybody's mind and everybody in the, in the audience has heard those that uh, are being offered for the consent, I'd rather the, the commission take those up so that we don't cause confusion by reading out other numbers, other cases. Yes, yeah, so let's, let's do that. Okay. Um, so just to be perfectly clear, the items on the consent are items 5A, 5B, 9, 11, 16, 17, 26, 30A, 30B, 32, 33, 34, 36, 37, 39, and 43. Yep, that's correct. All right, so you've heard the items for uh, the consent agenda. Is there a motion? There's been a motion, second. Any discussion? All in favor of the consent agenda say aye. aye. Uh, no, and the consent agenda of the items I read has been adopted. Now let's read the ones that we are list that we are going to hear tonight. So that if if you don't hear these numbers, we've either deferred it, withdraw, withdrew it, or deferred it, or put on the consent agenda, which means it passed already. Okay, just so everybody understands that. So go ahead. Bob. Okay. So the items that I have to be heard would be item three, ten, twenty-two, twenty-five. Um, 23 also, sorry, and then 31 and 35. Okay, hold on one second. I, I went out of order, so let me do it again in order. 3, 10, 22, 23, 25, 31, and 35. That looks correct to me. I want to make sure Mr. Sloan has the same list that, that we had, <laughs> Mr. Director. All right. Yeah, that, that's correct on my list as well. All right, perfect. So let's get started. Well, uh, if everybody that doesn't have any items, go ahead and if you'll exit the room quietly and then we'll get started on item number three. Okay, item number three is a proposed text amendment in regard to glazing. The proposed amendment adds a note to table 17.12.020, which is the bulk table for single family and two family dwellings as follows. Um, what the note does is it, in specific zoning districts, which are all listed out, which are primarily single family and one and two family zoning districts, it adds a standard which requires building facades fronting a street shall provide a minimum of one principal entrance and a minimum of 25% glazing. 
In reviewing the proposed text amendment, staff analyzed what other municipalities do in regards to glazing and also looked at what are currently in our standards in Metro. So the zoning code currently does not specifically define glazing. Um, the zoning administrator has interpreted glazing to be windows and doors. Now, there are some specific standards currently in the zoning code in regards to glazing, and those primarily apply to mixed-use districts and also multifamily within ad adaptive residential. Um, many municipalities regulate glazing through building and energy codes, um, which is to provide for adequate light and ventilation as it applies to the health, safety, and wel welfare of the occupants. So that's generally handled through building codes. Um, the Metro code through the building code currently requires a total glazed area for habitable spaces to be 8% of the floor area. Now, in reviewing specific plans, staff will often require specific glazing percentages. 25% is often used as the benchmark, but it can vary depending on the context of the SP as well as the building type. With specific, uh, with specific plan zoning, building elevations are submitted and reviewed with the final site plan. Glazing can be adjusted at the that time based on design. Staff is, allow as staff is um, able to holistically look at the project as a whole to make determinations on what is appropriate given the context, landscaping, and those sorts of things. Staff is recommending disapproval of the requested text amendment. Um, a countywide 25% requirement may have unintended consequences, such as favoring certain architectural styles that more readily incorporate glazing. For instance, we often see that a more modern style more readily incorporates glazing than a traditional style, and so this may be uh, favoring one style over another unintentionally. Um, additionally, setting a standard of 25% across the board provides no flexibility, which is built into the SP process now when we're reviewing the elevations with final site plans. Um, additionally, with the requirement for a door, a principal entrance to be located on any homes located on a corner lot, there could be alternative methods to achieve the design goals um, that we haven't fully evaluated. but it may go too far in appropriateness for countywide um, standards. So staff does recommend disapproval. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, this item is open for public hearing. Uh, and the council lady is not here who's proposing the bill, which is really the applicant um, for the zone change. Um, so um, we'll just... Is there anyone in the audience wishing that's in favor of this text change? Anyone in opposition? Anyone in opposition? Seeing none. This item's closed for public hearing. Let's start with Jessica, you want to go first? Vice Chair. Uh, um, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand what was the uh, intent for proposing this? Um, I, without the council member being here, it's kind of hard to, to say what the intent was, but I know that the number um, was, was probably uh, derived from uh, language that we've used in a number of our SPs. Uh, but as Lisa pointed out, in, in the SP, if, uh, if they come in with a uh, housing style that they want to put into, let's say, uh, the a subdivision or a development, you know, even if it's one unit, mm -hmm. they might show us the the structure, and it might not meet the 25 percent, but it meets the intent of the SP, uh, or there may be a design review committee within the SP that can look at it. But it can be dealt with at a more administrative level, and it's it's easy to move through. The problem with doing this countywide is that you would have to go to the BZA uh, to get any sort of modification for that. And um, as Lisa pointed out, what might work in a, a small design-based SP uh, isn't necessarily uh, 
as acceptable as is useful countywide. So that's why we recommended disapproval. But I think that was the, the gesture was to try and get a better uh, quality of, of development across the county. I just don't think this is the right tool for that, and that's why we have disapproval. Okay. No, I, I fully see that this seems uh, burdensome to impose countywide, so I support staff's recommendation. Well, instead of going around and letting everybody speak, is um, you know, since it, I, I feel like maybe we have a consensus, Can, maybe. I, I'm oh. happy to make a motion that we accept staff's recommendation. Let's let's see if there's any other questions first. Any, any other questions? Okay, there's been a motion, a second. Any other, yeah, discussion, question? Question, yeah, um, just because I have had some conversations with the council member on this, I know her frustration was uh, based on some properties that were being built in her area that perhaps had no glazing on the front. Um, and so my question would be, is there some minimum like 10 or 15 percent that might just start the conversation but not be burdensome that might achieve her goal without being burdensome countywide? I just would like to have that discussion. Well, we've talked to codes about that because really what you're taught, what this is meant to get at also is when somebody has just their base zoning entitlements and they're going to develop under those entitlements, and there might be a, a more appropriate number, like 15, um, that would require some level of, of glazing. Now, we also, after talking to the codes department, realized that we probably need to define what that is because there seems to be some ambiguity at least uh, between the planning department and codes about what how you measure the glazing uh, so yeah I think there's a way to, to get to a more appropriate amount um, but just what we have in front of us we think is is too much any other discussion it's been a proper motion and second to disapprove this item all in favor of disapproval say aye oppose no it's been this item has been disapproved we are on to item number 10. Lisa, you got 10 as well? Oh, who's got 10? Let's see here. Oh, there we go, Patrick. Go ahead. Okay. The next item on this evening's agenda is item 10, Harpeth Village SP. This is a request to rezone property located at 7725 Old Harding Pike from residential <laughs> single family, RS40, to specific plan residential to permit up to 25 residential units. The subject parcel is outlined in red. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The property is currently zoned RS40, which is intended for single family dwellings with a minimum required lot size of 40,000 square feet. The policy for the site is T3 Suburban Neighborhood Maintenance and Conservation. The neighborhood maintenance policy is intended to preserve the general character of developed suburban residential neighborhoods. The T3 neighborhood maintenance areas have established development patterns consisting of low to moderate density residential development. Conservation policy is intended to preserve environmentally sensitive land features through protection and remediation. The proposed structures on the site plan are consistent with the existing pattern of the previously developed um, neighborhood to the south. The site plan proposes 25 residential units on 5.08 acres. The site contains a single point of access from Old Harding Pipe. All units shown on the site plan will front onto a central um, green space with a sidewalks, um, excuse me, within the interior of the site. Sidewalks will provide a pedestrian connection from each unit to the future greenway located to the east. Also included is a 75-foot greenway conservation dedicated on the site plan. There will also be a pedestrian connection included from the interior of the site all the way to Old Harding Pike, located to the west on the site plan. A B-level landscape buffer will be placed along the south and north property lines and along the western property line to buffer the existing single-family house to the north 
and the existing multifamily housing to the west and south. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to approve the conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Thank you very much. We'll open this item up for public hearing. Is the applicant, you come up. And I know Mr. Henry knows that he has 10 minutes. He can reserve two of that, two of those minutes for rebuttal. More than two. Uh, yes, my name is Gary Batson. I'm the applicant civil engineer for this project. Um, we are in agreement with staff comments. Uh, we would just like to point out that uh, this development to the south of us is a commercial development, which we will be providing access to. Uh, just north of that is a residential development that's eight units per acre. Uh, we, our development is five units per acre, so we are stepping down, as you would think uh, would be the, uh, the planning, work, planning uh, agenda. So. Uh, we are stepping down our, our stormwater. We've worked with staff on stormwater. We've adjusted our um, grading plan to reflect uh, all their comments. We show cut and fill will be required. We understand that. Uh, we will balance the site on that. Our floodway, I mean, our stormwater features are, are shown on the grading plan, excuse me, are shown on the grading plan, which uh, uh, will meet all metro uh, standard requirements. Uh, as mentioned, our access, we will have a future access to the Greenway, to the uh, west of us, and uh, they will be able to immediately access the commercial development south of us by going up to Old Harding Pike. Um, we, uh, we, we agree with all buffers. The buffers are located on our property as required, and we uh, will install all those if required. Uh, traffic up there, uh, the difference between if this was developed as it's zoned now and, the, and developed as it is now, uh, reading uh, planning staff comments, is 13 cars in the uh, morning peak time and 13 cars in the afternoon peak time. So. Uh, we, we are also doing roadway improvements. We are doing a left turn lane into our site and widening the road so that those cars will have a dedicated lane and will not block traffic as they're waiting to queue, in, queue and go into our site. Um, the uh, driveway uh, depths uh, are five feet, which is a mainstay for alley, uh, alleyway development. So. Uh, those work all over town, and that's uh, what we have here with the, with the interconnectivity. The traffic will be slowed down because of the uh, design of the uh, turns and the circulation, and the five foot, again, is a standard uh, uh, driveway depth. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Sean Henry, 315 Dedrick Street, uh, here on behalf of the applicant uh, and the developer. Uh, importantly, with this project, this is actually filling out what is uh, really Harpeth Village proper. Uh, Mr. Napier, if you could pull up the aerial photo, I think that'd be helpful. Uh, as opposed to considering this uh, an infill project, this is really filling out the edge of the commercial district, which is Harpeth Village. Um, as you can see uh, in the aerial photo, that is a public shopping center uh, in the screen under the uh, CEL label there along Temple Road, and the subject property is really being tucked in behind what is considered the enclave. It's called the enclave at, uh, at Harpeth Village. Uh, the enclave next door is 59 units. We're talking about 25 units here. But the ability for the folks who are gonna buy into this development uh, to take advantage of the sidewalk network that my client's going to uh, extend would allow folks to walk and shop and eat and really uh, the opportunity re to reduce traffic uh, trips in and out of that commercial village. And that's the kind of thing and from a mixed use standpoint that we're all looking for. Um, the, uh, the Sonic that uh, was just approved by you on consent is just at the bottom of that, that uh, aerial photo next to Advance Auto. Uh, so folks could even walk to the Sonic without having to get in their car and go, go sit at the, uh, the outdoor window of the Sonic. Uh, Chaffin's Barn Dinner Theater is at the far end of this commercial development of Harpeth Village, uh, and there's an existing sidewalk network that connects all of that. So as you can imagine, uh, really a little more than a half mile walk, folks here could walk over to, uh, to enjoy themselves at uh, Chaffin's Barn. 
Uh, so there's a serious sidewalk network in place and this project will extend that. Uh, regarding the uh, concern for traffic, uh, this aerial photo shows across the street the Poplar Creek uh, neighborhood. There's also the colonies that's uh, part of that. That development has an extensive and well-planned network of streets that get folks out onto Old Harding Pike. Uh, Poplar Creek Trace is the nearest street to this project, but just to the north, about 700 feet to the north, is a South Colony Drive that allows folks in that neighborhood to come out and exit onto Old Harding Pike and to make that left-hand turn. Now, there's no light there, but they can go up to the next street to the north just off the aerial, which is Poplar Creek Road. Poplar Creek Road has a traffic light at Old Harding Pike. Again, they can take advantage of that to turn left and, and to go north uh, towards Nashville. If they want to head south, they can take Collinswood Drive over to Collins Road and get out onto Highway 100. So there's four points of ingress, egress for uh, those folks who live across the street. Point of clarification as to the 13 additional trips that this project will will bring during the peak hour. That is above and beyond if this property were to develop out as a six lot subdivision uh, as currently zoned. So as currently zoned, it'll support about six lots according to the staff report. Uh, this development is an additional three, uh, 13 uh, cars during that peak hour. Uh, as mentioned, the, the density here is less, so there is a step down in density from the higher uh, commercial intensity, and uh, the uses, uh, excuse me, the range of uh, units are far less at 25. This, this development density is five dwelling units per acre. The enclave next door is right at eight, 8.4 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the home sizes, the style of the homes, the architectural design, the character, and the price point are gonna be completely comparable to what's there now. So again, uh, we support the staff recommendation. This will allow the project to really fill out that, that space that's there. It's just begging for a similar type development that's adjacent to it. We ask for your support and we'll be here to rebut any comments uh, in a few moments. You got two minutes for your rebuttal. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Good to see you. Oh, we yeah, have seven letters of support. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up. And if anyone wishing to speak in support could line up in the middle there. Come on up. State your name and your address, and you have two minutes. Uh, my name is Steve Jacobs. I live at 5235 uh, Split Creek Road in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Uh, I'm the managing partner for REMAX Masters. It's a real estate company here in Nashville. And uh, I represented the sales for all the Enclave at Harpeth Village uh, phases one and two, the adjoining community. And uh, just want to talk about a couple of things. One, uh, enjoyed the sales in the uh, Enclave at Harpeth Village over the years. Uh, sales were always way ahead of construction. Uh, I think it's a product that's definitely needed for the community. Um, my office now gets calls all the time wanting to know if there's going to be the future phase because they've heard, you know, rumors about it. So I want to, you know, touch on that. Uh, also, the, the fact that uh, resales have been almost non-existent in the community, which I'm very proud of, which means everybody there loves the community. Uh, second point is... Uh, Years ago, evidently, the Enclave went through the same process. 59 people were given the opportunity to build a new home, form a community. I've watched those people become friends and neighbors and walk and, you know, like you were talking about, walk to the community and the shopping across the street. Really enjoyed that process. And so I'd like to ask for, you know, the other 25 people uh, in the next phase to be given the same opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Please come on up and y'all line up and uh, everybody get two minutes each and you just need to state your name and your address. My name is John Fissinger. I own the 7721, the property to the north of the development. Uh, obviously, the traffic there is going to be horrendous. Uh, we did a, a count last Friday on it for one hour. And there was 1,769 cars past our driveway. That's in one hour. This is a two-lane road with a 40-mile-an-hour speed limit. Uh, putting a left turn lane in there is not going to do anything except back up traffic from Poplar Creek on through. Uh, as it is now, you have backups continually up to Temple Road. You have backups continually about 500 feet to the other to the north side 
it's, it's really insane. Uh, another point there is this whole property was flooded in the, in the uh, 2010 flood. It was completely underwater. I saw it with my own eyes. I was home. Uh, it almost got to our house. Our house was just a little bit higher than there. Came within a foot of our house. Uh, this is complete insanity. We've already seen what happens. Why keep repeating the same thing for someone from another area can come in and basically tear apart our community as it is to make a few bucks? That's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Dan Applegate, and I'm the new uh, HOA board president for the Enclave, which is pictured in the uh, overview above. I'd like to request if I could get a five minute for the representing the HOA. Yeah, we. It's in our rules that we do that. If without objection, five minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Danny Applegate, and and the board president of the newly formed two-month-old HOA of the Enclave. Our community is, an, is immediately adjacent to the land that the developer proposes to rezone. My home and the home of Enclave neighbors here today will be directly affected on a daily basis by this proposed rezoning. The proposal before you today is essentially the same proposal that was reviewed by planning staff on March 10th of 2016 Planning Commission agenda. The planning staff report dated March 10th, 2016 recommended disapproval of the plan and the developer pulled the plan from the Planning Commission agenda. In March 2016, the planner recommended disapproval for three primary reasons. Number one, the proposed plan did not protect environmentally sensitive areas, the floodplain and wetlands. Number two, the proposed plan did not provide coordinated vehicular access to traffic. And number three, the proposed plan did not protect the integrity of the adjacent areas, specifically the single family home at the beyond concrete driveway that now exists. These valid land use concerns led planning staff to recommend disapproval when the plan was submitted with a request to approve a 25 unit PUD with a private road emptying onto Harding Pike and to rezone the land MR, I'm sorry, RM6 in March of 2016, 10 months ago. The critical planning concern in the March 10th, 2016 report were not even mentioned in the current staff report, which recommends approval of essentially the same plan not requested for SP zoning. The plan with SP zoning will have the same negative effect clearly stated in the poor planning or in the prior planning staff report. As someone who lives on the property, I can assure you the request to have this proposed property excuse me, proposed plan approved as an SP did not have magical effect to change the essential characteristics of the property. The homeowners of the Enclave, including me, don't understand why this proposal is back on the Planning Commission's agenda with the staff report recommending it for approval. It is a mystery to us why the current staff report ignores the sound planning analysis that, le that led to a staff recommendation for disapproval of the plan less than a year ago. As president of the HOA, I wanted to confirm the opinion of the members of the HOA with regards to this proposed plan. I distributed a written survey to the HOA membership and 100% of the neighbors responding to the survey stated that they opposed the proposed property plan. <coughs> based on the land use concerns I've, I have noted. <clears throat> I respectfully request that the 36 survey respondents that I have with me be entered into the record. Some of these neighbors were unable to attend tonight due to work and other commitments. Next, I would like to expand on the homeowners <clears throat> of the enclave's concern with the prior points. Number one, environmentally sensitive areas, the floodplains. The property flooded in, two in 2010 and at any given time after rainfall in this area continues to have water standing on it. FEMA maps are on paper as we as neighbors see what happens to this property after a substantial rain. And we don't think that we should be asked to discount the evidence of our own eyes as the flood, flood prone nature of this property. And number two, the vehicle access and traffic. 
with the potential of adding up to 200 car trips per day to this area, it will create a heavy burning burden on an already congested Old Harding Pike and Temple Road area. In turn, will create a possibility for accidents both entering and exiting the property in the entire area. In closing, I'd like to thank you for your consideration on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. And can I enter these yeah, into? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Come on up. Two minutes. State your name and. Good afternoon. My name is Bill Arth, and I am. <clears throat> I live at 6912 Collinswood Drive in Poplar Creek Estates. I'm also the HOA president of the Poplar Creek HOA. However, I'm not testifying as uh, in that official capacity, so I'll keep it under two. We uh, do appreciate it. Good afternoon, members of the Planning Committee, uh, Commission and staff. My name is Bill Arth, and I'm a homeowner in Poplar Creek Estates, a community of approximately 370 homes that rest directly across Old Harding Pike from where the proposed change would take place. I'm here today to offer testimony in opposition to the proposed change. As you know, the proposal drafted for 25 units at 7725 Old Harding Pike would rely on a single point of ingress and egress. This drive is a literal stone's throw from uh, Poplar Creek's own primary access point at the corner of Old Harding Pike and Poplar Creek Trace. I'm concerned about the impact that this addition will have on my neighbor's ability to safely turn left out of the neighborhood, uh, particularly during peak times. In addition to being a homeowner, I'm currently uh, serving as president of the Poplar Creek uh, Association. And while I am not speaking on their behalf, nor does the HOA uh, has had the practice of taking stances on development items, uh, I will say that in my capacity uh, and involvement with the HOA, uh, the ability to exit the neighborhood at this intersection is a perennial concern for my homeowners. Uh, long waiting times are currently very common during the morning commute to 40 East and adding dozens of vehicles that will be able to turn right onto Old Harding just upstream for our, from our own exit threatens to worsen the traffic environment that already encourages and sometimes necessitates risk taking and can be particularly treacherous in poor driving conditions. Um, since my original letter, I've been made aware of some concerns about uh, the potential of turning right out of this new development to then use our drive to make a U-turn. Uh, while that sounds wild, I think it, it sounds plausible, which points uh, in some ways to the already s stressful traffic conditions there. Uh, I'll leave my remarks for record, and I'm available to the commission at any time with questions. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Brent Klingenbeard, and I'm a resident of the Enclave. Uh, my opposition to this plan is based state on your its in You got to state your address. Your I'm address. Sorry. Oh, 1025 Pine Meadow Court. Thank you. My opposition to this plan is based on its inconsistency to policy guidelines laid out in the Bellevue Community Plan. The proposal, as you know, was originally reviewed by planning in March of last year and was recommended for disapproval. The primary reasons, or one of the primary reasons for this recommendation was due to it not it failing to meet the conditions that are guided within the conser conservation policy. In the latest report from planning, although the CO policy is referenced in the first part of the staff report, it was left out of the decision for approval with conditions. As I mentioned, this was a factor for the recommendation for disapproval previously. The only notable change between this plan and the previous plan was the zoning. For that reason, it seems appropriate that the conditions associated with CO policy should still apply. And those conditions are as follows. A large portion of the subject property lies within either the 100 or 500 year floodplain at the confluence of the Harpeth River and Trace Creek. The majority of this land was flooded in 2010. This development requires significant alteration to the floodplain, which goes against the CO policy guidelines as laid out in the Bellevue community plans regarding alteration to the floodplain as well as the call for protection of environmentally sensitive areas. Outside of the inherent risk posed by flooding, there are other reasons why this development has been met with significant opposition. The Harpeth River was designated a scenic river over 40 years ago and in 2015 was identified as the ninth most endangered river in the United States. The policies laid out in the community plan were put there specifically to prohibit this type of overdevelopment so that we preserve the natural, 
the natural features and of the river and its surrounding environment. I and the large group of my neighbors that I'm here with ask that you disapprove this proposal. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Monica Shaw. My son, Russ Shaw, resides on 902 Silkwood Circle. He works nights and he asked me to represent him at this uh, meeting. Uh, he's strongly opposed to this proposed plan for all the reasons that have been stated by our HOA president. Um, he would like for you to know that since October 2015, residents of the Enclave have been inundated with false statements and threats such as storage units and trailers that would be built on that piece of land if we did not agree to the plan. The developer and his agent circulated such, such misleading information to our residents to the extent that our councilman felt compelled to dispel this information with a letter to us. Uh, the current staff report recommends approval. For some unexplained reason, all the standards that Jason Swaggart's uh, March 2016 report um, which recommended disapproval, have now disappeared. Instead, it lists, such, uh, walk lists a walkability via a walkway through the enclave without our permission, with a 25% incline, and that is not ADA compliant. Uh, the developer also only owns part of that land that he would need for that walkway. Uh, we noticed that stormwater um, requested to apply FEMA standards that will not come into effect, uh, into effect until April 2017. And we wonder how that is appropriate. Uh, FEMA flood maps are only part of the issue. The actual field conditions are that a, the, um, a major por a portion of the parcel flooded in 2010. The area stays wet and soggy at all times. Large areas are covered with standing water after rain. And some of our residents report that rivers of water are going by their decks during extended rain. <coughs> As res a resident who is a licensed surveyor, <coughs> Oh, I'm running out of time, <laughs> and the surveyor is here. Uh, may I uh, submit this? Yes, ma'am. His notes? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Krista Schreffler. Um, before I begin sp speaking, I'd like to finish the comment. The licensed surveyor who is here to speak will note that the proposed finished floor elevation of the proposed units is 10 feet below the floor elevation level of units at the Enclave, which are higher lying but flooded during the 2010 flood. My name is Krista Schreffler, and I've lived in Bellevue at 712 Burley Court since 1988. I have been a residential real estate agent active in Bellevue for more than 20 years. I'm here to speak in opposition as a nearby neighbor. My neighborhood is three minutes up Highway 100 from the property in question. I want to see that the continued development in Bellevue is consistent with good land use policies. The Bellevue community has developed sensibly under the Bellevue community plan, which grew from the original subarea six plan. My husband, John Rumble, was a member of the original subarea six committee. The proposed plan is not appropriate land use for the reasons already cited, including those stated in the March 10, 2016 planning staff report, which recommended disapproval. Additionally, the current staff report recommends approval in part because the report states that it meets infill guidelines, quote unquote. When I requested to see the infill guidelines, Planner Patrick uh, Napier sent me the T3 Suburban NM guidelines from the Community Character Manual. The Suburban Neighborhood Maintenance section of the manual contains only two passing one word references to infill, quote unquote once on page 169 and once on page 172. I confirmed with the planner that there are no further written material relative to infill guidelines. My strong belief is if there are no written guidelines for infill, staff cannot posit that any development is consistent with guidelines that do not exist in written form. To Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Steve Spears. I live at 1005 Pine Meadow Court. Thanks for giving the residents around this property an opportunity to have their voices heard. You would be hard pressed today to drive any mile in Davidson County and not see some sort of construction. I would like to ask you the question, does the purchase of property with dollar signs in your eyes give you the right to rezone and negatively affect the lives of those around it? 
Since this was first made public in late 2015, our Councilman Dave Rosenberg has been witness to the overwhelming opposition to the rezoning of this property. As currently zoned, only three to four homes could be built, and I have a plot I'll give to uh, Mr. Napier to show that. That's a far cry from 25 residences proposed. I would have never moved into my town home if I had known I was looking at 25 rooftops. There are 20 adjacent property owners at the Enclave, the Bissingers, and everyone that lives at Poplar Creek Estates that will be affected by this. I find it hard to believe that this project is still being considered when it was tried last year and Jason Swaggart and the staff disapproved it. They're proposing three buildings, 11 units that are in the area that was proven to flood in May of 2010. I have attached a plan with the May 2010 flood waters overlaid on it. It is risky to guess how water will react and displace by altered floodplain areas. There were very few months in 2016 that the news didn't report 100 or 500 year flood events somewhere in this country. There's ever present chance that another thing like that would happen again. In conclusion, I feel there are some properties that are just not meant for high density development. The resuming and development of this property has a negative effect on hundreds of neighbors. This property may exist burdens attached to it, flood, traffic, and illegal easement. Just the other side of the tree line is the Harbourth River, and everything beyond that is floodplain. The environmental impact is yet to be determined. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ken Skinner. I live at 910 Silkwood Circle in the Enclave of Harpeth Village. If you look at that little um, picture up there, I'm the guy right there. That is, I'm across from John. Good to see John drive by every once in a while. But I will begin seeing more cars coming by the side of my house and behind my house, and I'm, I'm just not wild about it. I think the distance, uh, uh, Chairman Adkins, between this podium and where you're sitting is around, I'm going to guess, 11 feet which is the distance between the near edge of John's Drive and where the tree line is outside my home. So these cars not only would be passing, but they'd be passing within 11 feet of where I might be standing out in the yard doing yard work, whatever. Again, I'm just not wild about it. I am happy that the uh, move has changed from the uh, turning off of, um, was gonna come off of uh, Temple Road and go in front of my house to hook into the drive. And now we're talking about coming off 70 South. So small, uh, small victory there uh, in rerouting the traffic. But uh, I echo the uh, concerns of traffic of the other folks. And uh, I'm here because uh, actually I'm the one that'll get to see most of the cars. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Summers. I'm at 918 Silkwood Circle in the Enclave. Uh, last year, and I won't repeat a lot of the material that has already been covered here, but last year the PUD was uh, disapproved and never made it to the committee. Uh, and again, the three points that they brought up were the, uh, they did not protect environmentally the sensitive areas. In other words, it flooded last, in 2010. The plan didn't provide coordinated vehicular access and the proposed plan did not protect the integrity of the uh, adjacent areas. So now it's an SP, as we're here tonight to talk about. Uh, Public Works traffic engineer estimates that there will be approximately 200 trips along the road, the, the, one of the red lines that you see up there. I'm right next to the red line. And so my real concern is on the, there'd be 200 trips on that one road coming into that area. And right next to us means I would have traffic traveling on that access road from my kitchen table to, to the, uh, uh, for my kitchen table to be 25 feet. So it's roughly from this podium to the wall. There's just gonna be 200 plus routes on that access road that day when we build it, when, if this passes. I'm in opposition to this, of course. My wife and I may uh, be impacted because of the increased traffic along the access road. Old Harding is already loud enough for us. It's extremely busy all day long and the road's narrow and it almost seems to be at capacity. Um, our concerns are for higher traffic accidents, increased risk and compromise to safety as it relates to traffic incidents. Uh, and it's just, it's just congested in that whole area. It will affect our quality of life. I appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Kathy Summers, Mark Summers' wife. Um, we love Bellevue. We just love, we moved here four years ago from Southern California and we are never leaving. <laughs> Um, we love our, our townhome on, at the Enclave. We have a great quality of life. And so basically, I would just like to speak as a mom and as a neighbor for my friends, the other moms that couldn't be here. Um, we live, I look right outside my window and there's going to be a road with 200 cars, but my friends walk their dogs. Um, they have grandchildren that come to visit. And so I'm just trying to think common sense is this really the right plan f to be next to us? And, um, and I don't believe it will be. Uh, we have kids learning how to drive. I can't imagine the people living in that area having young children learning how to drive, turning left or right out of that road onto Old Harding Pike. It's horrifying. Uh, I sit on my back uh, patio and I watch Mr. Bissinger Friday night counting the cars with three helpers. There are semis semis. There are semis with cars on them. Where are they going in Bellevue? There's no car dealerships on our end of town. There are semis starting at 3 in the morning. They're going 50 to 60 miles an hour. I can't imagine our children trying to turn out of their neighborhood. It's just not safe. And Poplar Creek as well. I brought a picture so you could see how close. I mean, you have an aerial here, but I want you to see if I can put this on the record, how close we are. How how close we are to 10 feet. And yes, there's going to be a buffer zone, and there's going to be little tiny shrubs. And then there's going to be a big road with tons of cars. It's just not safe. And I worry about the grandchildren, the Bissinger's grandchildren playing in the yard, if those cars go barreling down there. Thank you for your time and your service. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the planning staff, my name is William Denniston. My wife Barbara and I live at 908 Solkwood Circle, adjacent to the property that is under consideration. I have questions regarding the proposed plan analysis from the Metro Planning Commission meeting document of 310 2016 compared to the Metro Planning Commission meeting documented dated 1 12 2017. In the March 2016 analysis regarding the access to the proposed development from Old Harding Pike, there were concerns of the access meeting public works standards and requirements including site distance. Additionally, the document states, quote, even if the access point into Old Harding Pike could meet the minimum requirements for access, it would not meet the minimum requirement of coordinating vehicular access, which increases safety for drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians." End quote. The January 12th document makes no reference of the Public Works Concerns analysis of March 2016, but only states, quote, the site contains a single point of access via a private road connecting to Old Harding Pike. Because the revised development plans appear to have only changed the planned location of the streets and housing units, but no apparent changes to the access point, I have the following questions and I think need to be answered. Number one, what are the public work standards that were of concern in the March 10, 2016 document? How have the March 2016 concerns regarding the public work standards and requirements, including site distance, been resolved by the newly submitted plans? And if the access points into Old Harding Pike does meet the minimum requirements for access, how then has the issue of minimum requirements of coordinating vehicular access been resolved? Finally, we feel that the current zoning of RS-40 is correct for the subject property. Five housing units should be the maximum allowable for this location and for the safe point onto Old Harding Pike. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you all for your service and for listening to us today. Um, I want to say that I am in support of everything my neighbors have just said. The issue which brought me here today is the issue of vehicular safety. I took photographs, which Man, I we said, need your name and your address. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Margaret Robertson, and I live at 6757 Autumnwood Drive in Poplar Creek Estates. 
and I go, come and go through the Poplar Creek Trace exit from Poplar Creek Estates. And I have lived there for 11 years. I can tell you that the traffic has increased a great deal since I first moved there. And I took photographs um, from the entrance of Poplar Creek Estates, which I sent today, but apparently not early enough for those photographs to be shown on the screen and shown to you. But I can tell you that the distance from here to here is greater than the distance from the exit of Poplar Creek Estates to that road coming out. So two cars, basically, trying to come out at the same time create a major problem. In addition, there is a light at Temple Road, as you've been told, and another one at Poplar Creek Road. And those two lights seem to release the traffic so that if the traffic is not coming from one side, it is coming from the other which makes it very difficult for existing cars to come out. If 25 units are going to be built there, I don't know how the calculations of how many road trips um, was made, but there are often two cars per family and sometimes three. So I think that the amount of traffic this will create will be greatly in excess of what was suggested. I ask that you consider not allowing the zoning change unless a different spot of ingress and egress on either Temple or Highway 100 is found. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? The applicant has two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, the, um, I think it's important for the commission to understand the difference between what my client proposed in 2016 and what you have in front of you, and it really centers on the interior design of the property. Uh, previously, uh, they were proposing uh, front-loaded garages just like the Enclave has next door. What you have in front of you now are alley-loaded garages, and each of these homes, all 25 homes, sit on a uh, sit on a, uh, a common lawn. Their front porches overlook a common lawn with rear-loaded, alley-loaded uh, garages. That's the essence of the change in the design, which staff felt was an enhancement and an improvement over what was uh, previously looked at by staff. It's never been before this commission before. It was deferred before it came here. So that was one year ago. Uh, secondly, uh, the purpose of the new left turn lane is to allow continuous southbound flow of traffic. So uh, someone mentioned that th this is going to stop traffic dead in its tracks. That's not the case. Uh, the turn lane will allow traffic to, traffic to continue flow through the, through the uh, uh, turning movement there. Uh, thirdly, the finished floor elevation here is, I'm not sure where those uh, facts came from, but the finished floor elevation here is two feet above the lowest floor elevation in the enclave next door. And all of these elevations are above or exceed the uh, minimum required under the stormwater ordinance. So uh, the floodplain concerns are, are not a concern at all. So the technical requirements for this development, the site plan, buffer yards, traffic uh, access, all of the technical requirements are being satisfied here that address public safety and public welfare. Uh, and finally, this is a five acre vacant tract. It's not an infill development. Uh, this is simply filling out the edge of the Harpeth Village by increasing the residential mixture uh, in this in this village area. So we think that's the big picture here. The big policy picture for this commission is take a look at the village holistically. How does, does this fit or doesn't it fit within that concept? Uh, we certainly submit that it does and your staff agrees with that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, in light of the testament, I would ask that you disapprove this proposal. Um, it is very similar to what was brought last year and recommended for disapproval, which makes me think that this was a borderline approval, that it was a tough call about whether to uh, make the uh, recommendation of approval by staff. Um, I'll note briefly the concerns. Uh, Mr. Henry pointed out the main difference between the last proposal and the current proposal, which don't really address the reasons for the recommendation the first time around, um, being intense development within the floodplain, uh, intensity of uses, it said not consistent with the suburban neighborhood maintenance policy or the uh, conservation policy. It noted that it does not provide an appropriate transition from the PUD to the RS40 zoning district to the north, and also that it would not meet the minimum requirement of coordinating vehicular access. 
The reason with the, that the traffic, I think, is a, deal, a big deal is even though on the aerial it looks like a straight, clear road, it, it's got a hill there, so there's limited sight lines, and I think that's brought up a lot of the uses. Poplar Creek's way up on a hill. Um, so it, it just seems like there are good uses for this property, um, but I don't feel like this is it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. We appreciate seeing no other uh, testimony. I declare the public hearing closed. How about we start with Council Lady Allen? <laughs> or, or are you uh, you writing? Are you? We, we can start with someone else if you well, like. I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, okay. I, I appreciate what Councilmember Rosenberg has said with regard to um, changes being good. I mean, I, I, I certainly appreciate the alley loading as opposed to front front loading. I'm, I'm all about that. Um, but it doesn't seem like those were the concerns that were raised three years ago. So I would just continue to ask the question, um, are there better ways to deal with the concerns about consolidated traffic access and um, the single point of access and the transition to the to the RS? Those, those do not seem like they've been addressed. And if that was a problem last year, I'm not sure why it's not still a problem. So I'm going to listen. Thank you. Um, uh, the density that they're proposing, is it less than uh, what RM6 would allow or more? Less. less. Okay. Um, in concept, I think it's a good idea. It's a, you know, it's, it looks like it's a good product. I think that my biggest concerns are the stormwater concerns. I think it would be, I know that stormwater has already reviewed it, but with everything that um, the neighbors have said, they were there, they, they witnessed 2010 um, flood. I think I'm just worried about that and would like to kind of discuss that a little bit more. Um, but I wanna hear what everybody else has to say first. We do have a stormwater representative here, if Commissioner, if, if you would like to hear from him. I think we need a clarification. Come on up. All right, sounds good. It's good to see you back. Why, thank you, sir. Uh, greetings, commissioners, uh, council lady. Uh, I too was here in the May floods. Uh, this W area was kind of the area that I was roaming around trying to collect information on pipes that failed during this time. Uh, I will say that this is meeting the floodplain requirements. Uh, we require uncompensated fill, so any fill placed in the floodplain will have to be compensated. Um, these minimum FFEs for the houses will have to be four feet above the 100 year. Uh, I will say when uh, the neighbors say that there's been some massive flooding here, they would be correct. The Harpeth River actually crested eight feet above the 100 year. So it was, um, the Harpeth River really took a hit. Um, but we don't regulate eight feet above the 100 year, we regulate to the 100 year and ensure that all houses are built four feet above that. The last thing I'll say is the runoff from here should go into a bioretention area and make its way into the, into the trip. I think it's Trace Creek that goes into the Harpeth River. Well, and just for the record, uh, thank you. This is Steve Michu testifying. Yes, yes. Steve Michu, Metro Water Development Services. I'll stick around. Before you leave too, Steve, wasn't it really, was it a thousand year flood that was actually, or? It, it depends how you look at it. You know, it was really, it was really a, a unique situation. We had, we had a, a rain event and it wasn't continuous. It rained, it kind of stopped a little bit and it rained again. So if you look at it, you could say it, whether it was a thousand year or was it two back to back 500 years, it was just safe to say it was just a lot, a lot of water. All right, thanks, Steve. I'm just very scientific. Too. <laughs> Commissioner Blackshear. We heard a lot of testimony about this um, proposal as um, compared to the proposal that was in March of 2016. And we heard a lot of testimony about the particular reasons for the disapproval. And so I'd be interested in hearing you discuss the specific reasons for disapproval before and why you no longer think they're applicable in this proposal. So one of the main reasons was um, the configuration of the units as proposed um, in the initial plan that was submitted to planning, we had units along the northern property line which were pushed directly, almost directly against the northern property line 
and units that were along the southern property line, which would back up to the enclave units that you see there uh, to the south. Um, there was one central access point, uh, much the same as we have now, as you would only be allowed to have one access point given the narrow connection to Old Harding Pike. Um, that entered along that same corridor and then bisected the property to two rows of housing north and south. And then along the back, you had units that were pushed, um, I would say, a little bit more into the floodplain than what's shown here. Um, I don't have those exact measurements in front of me. Um, also, um, that we did have similar traffic concerns, similar floodplain concerns. That plan also received approval from Metro Public Works and from Stormwater. Thank you. That was actually really helpful. Um, it, it seems, I mean, the neighbors obviously, to the council lady's point, they have a much better on the ground um, knowledge about what's going on with the traffic and with the limited sight lines. Um, even if there's a left turn lane right there, it doesn't seem like that necessarily alleviates all of the safety concerns associated with that. Um, I mean, is there going to be a light there or is it just going to be the left turn lane? A light has not been proposed as part of this site plan. Okay. Um, I'm not sure um, that I'm completely there. Um, I don't think that it's a, a, a particularly bad plan, but I don't think that it's necessarily one that uh, I think I'm comfortable enough with to support it, especially given the neighbor's concerns. But I am interested in hearing what the other commissioners have to say. Commissioner Clips. <coughs> it's in some ways almost startling to see it <laughs> uh, because it's just so close to to, to the river and to the to what we've experienced there. Um, I'm I'm aware that the, the staff of course needs to look at specific standards um, that they as staff are not necessarily to recommend the best possible use from a planning perspective for land like this. Um, and and yet I I just wanted to know for our our deliber our consideration what would really good <coughs> land use here look like is it this proposal I don't know if any staff member wants to ask answer that but it doesn't uh, seem that way to me but I'm they probably want to field that um, but, you know it, we have to deal with the plans that we've been presented. Mm -hmm. And we really haven't been presented anything other than this set of plans. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of the concerns that you're hearing from the neighbors. Uh, we had internally as we looked at this, and I think that the councilman uh, may have been the one that stated that he thought it was probably a close call from uh, our perspective. And I think that's a, that's a fair statement uh, because of flooding problems that we know that uh, certainly Bellevue experienced a disproportionate issue in regards to the flood. Now, and in saying that, let me also say this, that, that you, you never want to try and have your land use policies uh, measured by your most extreme weather events. Uh, that's not a good way to plan your city. Um, and Bellevue certainly experienced an, uh, an unusual weather event. Uh, so. We were very careful to, to meet with the stormwater. As a matter of fact, we met with them again this this week, and I don't meet on every one of the cases that come through, but took the time to go and sit down uh, with Steve and with our staff to go over this one, because I had the same concerns just looking at it. Um, but Steve walked us through it uh, in detail with the stormwater maps. He explained why some of the stormwater maps showed uh, uh, the, the floodplain being in one location as opposed to what the topography would seem to indicate where the floodplain is. Uh, and we got to a place where we're comfortable that short of another biblical flood uh, that we believe that development in that area should be should be safe, uh, safely outside of the 100 year floodplain. Um, and as to the access points, uh, th there is this, this is the only spot that this property meets the public right-of-way. Uh, so in whatever way it develops, even if I were to answer your question in that, okay, this would be good for maybe, a, a, so let's, let's say, uh, more of an R40 or a, 
even RS40, you know, large single family lot uh, development, their access point still at this location. And I would tell you that, that, and I welcome staff to correct me, that when the development uh, that's just the south here of townhomes was built, um, I believe that we made a recommendation at that time that a connection be made or a stub be put into that development to allow for further development of the properties in the area. Is that correct, Bob? Well, the, in the, <clears throat> the development to the south, those are, those are private drives, and the plan that we saw in March of last year um, actually proposed to come through that, that PUD, and it's my understanding that there were several community meetings and, and that the people that lived in that PUD didn't want the access coming through that PUD, and the developer, um, we, we were pushing for the access to be through that PUD so that it would come out at Temple Road where there's signalized intersections, but it's my understanding, I wasn't at the community meetings, it's my understanding that the, the community did not want that to happen, so that left this developer with the choice of going out to Old Harding Pike. So, <laughs> a connection that we would normally try to encourage so that you don't have these two access points side by side wasn't built into this development to the south. And who was the developer? Uh, I believe Austin Daniel might have been the developer on the original PUD. Okay. But okay. That, that's how we ended up with this situation where you've got this property that has this one point of connection to the public right of way, uh, but is right adjacent to another development. Right, it has a one point of connection and um, the experience I've had is that when you have just barely offset connections, you have an awful lot of risk taking, whether it's in Green Hills or anywhere else, <laughs> speaking of bad just off center connections. Um, I think we have public works here too. Hmm? Public. Public. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure they've approved it as meeting minimum standards. I'm just trying to get a sense of whether this is still optimal given what we have. We're, we're actually not necessarily required as a commission to approve something as appropriate because it has received approvals from from public works and water. It's just something we can't approve it if they don't get it, but we don't have to approve it if they do get it. There are all these other things come into account. I'm not gonna be opposing this based on hand counts, but I, I, I'm, I don't think it's the best planning for this area. I think uh, I understand it's hard. I understand that it's not the worst zoning ever been proposed in Bellevue, but um, uh, there's just too many questions I have about the, the traffic, about the Fairly, you know, it's a small number compared to some of our approvals, but it's still a it's still a pretty dramatic percentage increase in what p they can be done right now versus versus what we can do if the if the Metro Council changes the law as as requested. So I'm I'm leaning against it, uh, I would say, and and uh, with full knowledge that it it could have been worse. It could have been a worse proposal. I just don't think that's good enough. Commissioner. Farr. Um, I think the, the concerns that have been raised so far pretty much echo my concern. Um, I was one curious in the report, we normally have our critical planning goals and we don't have any critical planning goals. Is that just an oversight or, or do we, we don't think there's any critical planning goals? <laughs> we did not cite any critical planning goals achieved by the plan. Okay. And then I go to Doug's point that he just made about um, we can't plan based on, you know, a catastrophic, our most catastrophic event, but we've seen a catastrophic event there. We've seen significant flooding on the Harpeth even outside of the catastrophic events. I mean, that definitely does flood more frequently. Um, and so for a project that we don't feel has critical planning goals, I'm struggling to see why we would want to even take a chance um, given you know, some of the concerns that have been raised about the traffic, um, and then just the visual that sticks, I think, in all of our mind of, of what this property looked like seven years ago. So um, I think that's that's where I am right now. Chairman? Yes. The, uh, <clears throat> I think the two items that of concern has been the traffic and the stormwater. 
And when the employee from uh, Stormwater came up and you know, the staff had made extra effort to uh, meet with him and were satisfied with that, um, I think it goes a long way in my uh, thought process whether this is, should be approved or not. Uh, the floor plans uh, or floor elevations is set by FEMA. Those have been raised since the flood of 2010. As he stated, whether you want to say it's a 1,000 or whether it's two 500 back to back, there was a lot of rain, but I think also, and I stand corrected if I'm wrong, but that there was an error made by the uh, Corps of Engineers that released a lot more water. Whether well, that affected um, Harpeth River or not, I don't know, but they released it at one time, and all of a sudden, within within an hour's time, people at uh, Harper Land were inundated, um, and I would stand to be corrected on that. Um, we do require, I would suppose, that the final plat uh, dug the uh, traffic impact study. Is that correct? Public Works is here, and they can speak to uh, traffic. You didn't honestly think just hiding around the corner was going <laughs> to. Uh, as far as a uh, traffic study requirements, state your name. And uh, Jonathan Honeycutt with the Department of Public Works. As far as the requirements for a traffic study, 25 units would have been below the thresholds that would have required a study to be conducted uh, by this development. But as part of their, this plan is approved as part of their access, there is road improvements of the widening of the roadway to the three lane section uh, to offset. Uh, but, is, but no traffic study was required because it's below the thresholds. I believe in here that in the um, report, and I, don't, I guess this came out of your office, uh, that if it's R S 40 as it is now in the AM, there'd be five trips if it was developed under R S 40. Is S P and the AM be 18 be a, a di that's a, during the peak time, 13 additional trips. In the PM, it's a little bit more, um, uh, well, it's about the same spread. There's seven in the morning and 20 at the evening, so the additional 13 trips at peak AM and PM, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. It's based on probability and statistics uh, from studies from other um, other similar type developments. And then all through the day, it increases from 58 to 198, which is 140 trips more, but spread out over a 24-hour period of time or 12 or 18 hours period of time. Is that the way you would calculate that? That is correct for a full day. So, mm -hmm. so, it, so the traffic impact, although it may be a narrow road, I don't know about that. But if you're proposing a left turn lane, so that should take care of part of the impact. So uh, I think that's the two issues that's on the table as far as my voting would be. So I'll pass and listen to the other commissioners. Ms. Hang, dear. Um, as always, our, my fellow commissioners have done a great job of asking all the right questions. Um, my only question, I think, is we talk about, uh, well, first of all, right now it's zoned for five units, and they're asking for 25, just a clarification point. T3 suburban maintenance, neighborhood maintenance, we've, we talk about that, but there's no discussion on the conservation piece. Is there, can you tell me why we don't have anything regarding the conservation piece in terms of consistent with policy? For that, we would rely on stormwater. Um, the impact on the conservation policy would be the um, berm and the bioretention that's proposed on the plan. I think, I think it was an oversight that the conservation policy is not listed in the staff report, but there, there are minimal amounts of development that can be permitted in conservation. Oh, I know that, and that's what just what we say we, 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 in the T3 you know, neighborhood maintenance policy, we talk about proposed height and setback, and, and, and we find it consistent, the staff finds it consistent um, with you know, adjacent development, although I think this is a unique lot simply because of the backup to the to the river as we continue to talk about. I mean, the other ones across the street may be similar, but they're in a different situation. So I, my question was, it's not a mention of being consistent with the conservation piece, and I, and it, it does apply to this, this area. And so we're just saying, yes, it is consistent. 
think Bob is correct. We we should have had something that explicitly said that we had looked at this in the context of the Flynn Plain in consultation with stormwater. We looked at the map and we determined that the footprint met our policy. Gotcha. Thank you. That's all I needed to know for the conservation policy. Okay. One more to go. Listen. Sorry. Guess I'm that one more. I um I first of all I'm not as concerned about the flood part because it is going to be. Um, above, two feet above, I think, the 100-year um, flood. And just as a designer, I know that that's, that's what all you can really do. I think it, I'd always, I kind of knew it was closer to a 1,000 years. So now I know it's two 500 years, so that's good to know. But um, but I, I do have um, a similar concern about the uh, entry on it. I wish, and as was kind of murmured, I wish it was closer to uh, took my glasses off the uh, Poplar Creek Road just so that maybe a light could be there um, to to be able to is that right Poplar no, Creek ten, or, ten, or either that yeah. or Temple Poplar Creek. Poplar Creek so that there could be um, a stoplight or something just to help help the residents as well as the neighborhood deal with the traffic that goes in and out um, and, and you know when Bob said that. That's what I was thinking. I was wondering, I wish they could just find a way to go back to Temple somehow, or at least have a second. What's well, one question, too? What is the um, maximum amount where you have to have a second entry? I um, had to have two entries into a PUD. What is the density requirement for that? I mean, the, the fire, fire. Fire, fire marshal generally requires a second point of access when you get uh, over 30 units. Okay, so, but it, for a single family, but for multifamily, I believe it's it's eighty or a hundred. I'm not exactly sure. Okay, well, um, so that was something else. So I, I wish the neighbors could have worked out something, but um, since there's op um, opposition to them using Temple Road as a second means, second means of, or at least a second means, if not the only means. Uh, I do feel like it's a pretty tight there trying to get out. It, I mean, it's it's the nature of that lot, and I understand that it's, it's difficult, but it seems like just inherently the way it is, uh, less density would probably be better in this situation. And, you know, uh, just looking at it, I, I, I wish if something could have been worked out where they could get back to Temple, I would feel a lot more comfortable, even if they have two ways in and out, you know, that way they could avoid it and like you said, it was a light down there, but I under, you know, understand the community opposition, but so anyway, um, that's my, my apprehension about approving this uh, SP. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Clifton, you had a question? I, I did. I wrote a note to myself to ask about the FEMA standards because I didn't quite, I didn't quite remember what they were saying. So what were, what was being said about the FEMA standards, the proposed FEMA standards, federal standards, what exactly would they do if they became effective? Okay, so well, once again, Steve Mishu with Metro Water. We, we go through a map revision probably once every 10 years. Uh, we were operating under the, when this first came around, we are operating under the 2001 maps. Um, and the floodway was kind of incorrectly mapped. It was kind of going up a slope. So when, when we got new contours, new, new LIDAR, new aerials, where we were able to, we meaning not me, but like the Corps of Engineers and their contractors were able to remodel and get the floodway at the right location. So we really didn't have much of a, if we go from the 2001 flood maps to today's flood maps that are in, in use today, uh, the floodplain elevation really did not change much. It's just, it's just more of a correction on the floodway and the buffers. Okay. And, and I don't mean to correct any of the commissioners Corps of Engineers, not not here, didn't affect on the Harpeth River, and the single family has to be four feet above the hundred year, not the, not the not two feet. Um, for conservation, we don't really have a conservation, but we have a preservation, uh, fifty percent, and there's there's a lot of floodway on the property, so I, I don't foresee a fifty percent preservation going to be an issue. Um, we we could definitely dive more into that, but for Thank a preliminary. you for the clarification. So yes, sir. when I wrote down FEMA standards, it's not like there are new regulations that are coming into effect potentially in the future. That's not it? 
No, sir, it's not necessarily FEMA standards. It's, uh, you know, they really, we really get the flood maps and they're set. And that's the, that's the FEMA maps that are, that are officially adopted. Um, and those FEMA maps preclude your approval of something if, if they're at a certain point. Well, it just so happens that Metro criteria are more stringent than FEMA's criteria. Okay. So while well, FEMA regulates residentials have to, residential structures have to be at the 100 year, uh, like I said, Metro's requirements are four, four feet above. So which, which again means you can't recommend, any, you have to reject or recommend rejection if they don't meet that. It, if, it says nothing about you're not man. I mean, it, it, it's not binding on us to, to say, well, that makes it a, a good plan. It means from your technical aspect, you couldn't approve it otherwise, and there, and now you, you, you can't. You don't need to stand in its way. Commissioner, you could do as you please. It's, uh, it's, you know, we'll, we'll review right. it based on our manuals and, okay. and, but, and the minimum recommendations. But I, I would want to point out that um, there's the federal flood insurance program that we're a part of. Uh, our standards are set at a level that makes us eligible uh, for that insurance. Um, and if we were to not follow those right. and start to approve things that fell below that standard, then we could lose eligibility for those. That well, that's what I'm trying to get at. What, we could. What, and all of this uh, means that we, there are things we can't approve without getting in trouble. Right. It, it could have some. must approve everything else. Yes, it could have some serious ramifications, Colin. Sure. Don't so count. all our rate payers in, in, in Davidson County actually pay less flood insurance <laughs> than maybe adjacent cities because our requirements are more stringent than, than, than the minimums. Okay. Well, we need a motion. Crickets. Motion. A motion to approve the That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Seeing no second, we need another motion. Will we disapprove? It's been a motion to disapprove. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any more discussion? All in favor of disapproval, say aye. Aye. Uh, hold, hold on one second. If I may, uh, I need you to articulate the, the reason for the disapproval. I made, I made that the motion, and um, I think that means that Jessica was going to articulate. <laughs> Go right ahead. Commissioner, would you like to explain uh, the reasoning, for reasoning for the disapproval? Um, the reasoning for the disapproval, well, I, we all had different reasons. Well, My reasoning it, it, for the disapproval was some concern about the flood way, even though we've discussed this. Well, I would tell you that, uh, as, as we always do, if, if we're able to go back and work with the, the, the developer about what the problems were that we heard as staff, and it okay. was uh, it was vehicular access. It was vehicular, vehicular access, access, but also really what I, I seemed to hear was the just the sheer number of units at this location. Yes, uh, that seemed to be um, the the two major points. Yes, thank okay. you for your reasoning, Commissioner. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Director. Any Sloan. other discussion? <laughs> All in favor of the disapproval, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Eyes haven't disapproved. We, um, so we've been going for almost two hours, but I was thinking we could make it through maybe one more presentation, or do we need to take a break? Is everybody, is, I'm, okay, so let's take a, we, we need to take a, we'll take a quick break, and then we'll be back in like about 10 minutes. You can always take your conversations out in the hall if you want to, but I know you're talking to the councilman, but go ahead. All right, the next item on this evening's agenda is item 22. This is a request to change the zoning on property at 2407 Brasher Avenue from one and two family residential R6 to specific plan mixed use zoning. The property is highlighted in red and it's located north of Strauss Avenue between Gallatin Avenue and Ellington Parkway in East Nashville. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. The current zoning on the property is R6, which is intended for one and two family dwellings with a minimum lot size of 6,000 square feet. 
The land use policy is T4 Urban Neighborhood Maintenance, which is, which is a residential only policy intended to preserve the general character of existing urban neighborhoods. The addition of a commercial use at this location is not supported by the policy. The proposal is for a regulatory SP, so there's no site plan, um, to permit an accessory recording studio use in addition to the uses that would be allowed in R6 zoning. The standards that are proposed in the regulatory SP um, are listed here. The R6 zoning would permit home occupations um, subject to certain conditions, but this particular proposal would involve serving clients on site, and that um, is not consistent with the home occupation standards, which is why the request for the regulatory SP has been made. A little um, history, council has reviewed several bills related to the home occupation standards in the zoning code um, recently. Although each kind of took a different approach, they were all generally aimed at the idea of allowing these uses to serve clients or customers on site, um, subject to various different limitations. Um, you can see the various bills outlined here. I would draw your attention in particular um, to the one at the bottom of the list, which was a 2012 bill which proposed allowing home recording studios as a home occupation. Um, it did permit um, clients on site subject to certain limitations. So that's the use that we're considering here. Uh, staff and the Planning Commission were um, in support of each of these proposals, but none of them found support at council. So um, three, including the re recording studio specific bill, were ultimately withdrawn um, after deferrals. And then one um, actually failed to be approved. That was the, the proposal to add home business uses. So home-based businesses may support some goals of the general plan, but staff's recommendation is that the introduction of those uses and the standards under which they would be regulated are best considered on a county-wide basis, given that council failed to find support for these types of uses on a broader level. Um, the use of an SP to allow a use like this in a specific location is um, inappropriate. The SP is also defined in a manner that calls for context-sensitive development. Um, so given the lack of broader support, the existing residential character of this area, the T4 neighborhood maintenance policy, which doesn't support commercial uses, um, staff does not find that the introduction of a commercial use in this location is consistent with the definition of an SP, nor that it yields context-sensitive development, and therefore staff recommends disapproval. Thank you very much. We'll open this item for public hearing. The applicant, uh, come on up. You'll have 10 minutes, and and then if you don't use the entire 10 minutes, you can reserve two minutes of that 10 for rebuttal. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the, of the Planning Commission, my name is Elijah Shaw, and I live at 2407 Brasher Avenue. I've been a resident there for 17 years, bought my home in 2000. Um, I love the neighborhood. I really enjoyed being there. I've um, grown to be great friends with my neighbors on all sides. Um, and I moved to Nashville 25 years ago to learn how to record music and for a love of making records um, and, and becoming part of the music scene here in Nashville, which I've learned how to do, um, graduate of MTSU in 95. Uh, so um, I would like to be allowed to work from my home studio, which uh, is something that is professionally soundproofed. Um, it, it would not disturb the neighbors in any way. I have not uh, been a disturbance for any of my neighbors in the time that I've been recording myself and my friends there in the past. Um, there is sufficient parking on my property to, to accommodate anybody that comes to work with me. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, working in music in Nashville can be pretty challenging, way to make a living, and working with local musicians and being able to accommodate them in my home studio and make records with them is a great way for me to participate in and give back to the local music communi community and also support myself and support my, my family. Uh, my daughter uh, was literally born in my house upstairs uh, 11 years ago. And so I'm, I'm a single dad living at home, um, 
do my best to feed my, my daughter and, and keep my home and work from there. And this would be a really excellent way for me to be able to support myself and support my daughter as well. Uh, I have gone around uh, and spoken to all my neighbors. I have um, six handwritten letters from my neighbors supporting my rezoning effort and my being allowed to work from my home and work from my home studio. I have um, four neighbors that are here right now at this, at this planning commission meeting. Um, I have a petition with 17 signatures on it from my neighbors on all sides. I, I, cannot, uh, I, I have yet to find a neighbor that didn't think it was a good idea and, and didn't want me to do this moving forward. So I have support. Um, I'm not asking for any new construction. I am, uh, don't want to change anything about the residential nature of my home. I love my neighborhood and I appreciate the, the neighborhood quality of where I live and I want to keep it that way. Um, uh, as I say, I've got sufficient room for parking cars there, so that's not really an issue. Um, I think that the home studio is really part of the lifeblood of what Nashville is. I mean, this is Music City, and I think we should be allowed to participate in helping to make music here and, and be part of this local music community, and that's what I'd like to do. Um, that's really everything I have to say about it. I just really, really uh, ask for your understanding and, and f uh, hope that you can grant me permission to be able to work from my home, which I think is very good for my neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. You want to reserve two minutes or? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Oh, uh, okay, go. My name is George Dean. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Mr. Shaw. He wanted to speak first and kind of explain to the commission um, what he was asking for. Uh, I know the commission's been briefed by the uh, planning staff, and I'll just I'll make my presentation very short as well. Um, uh, obviously, looking to. Um, uh, uh, 315 Dedrick Street, by the way, uh, between Entrecote and White, um, uh, is uh, the law firm I work with. Um, essentially, the, when the staff looks at this, they're kind of thinking of it as a commercial use. I kind of flip it the other way. It's basically a home occupation. Um, uh, in order to have a home occupation, the principal aspect of the use has to be residential. Um, uh, it's got to be customary and incidental to the residential use of the property. And uh, as the staff explained, Metro Nashville's got a rule that says you can't service clientele on the properties. And we've struggled over the years with expanding what we can do by way of a home occupation. Uh, it struck us that um, uh, perhaps if there's not a countywide solution, that if you look at individual areas of the city, uh, where they would be appropriate, where there's not uh, opposition to it, um, where it uh, uh, would work uh, well in the context of the already existing neighborhood, uh, that that piecemeal approach may work better. Uh, it's obvious that uh, it's been difficult to get um, a comprehensive review of home occupations through uh, perhaps piecemeal works a little bit better. Here there's no physical change to the property. Uh, in fact, uh, he, he has the studio is there already, uses it for his own personal use. Um, this request would allow a small number, uh, uh, not many on a per day basis coming into the, the property. Um, the um, uh, use would be accessory to the residential, incidental to the principal, principal use, the, uh, the actual uh, size of the recording studio as compared to the principal residential use of the property is much smaller. The residential use is the much larger part of the uh, property. The other thing that you usually look at in the context of uh, home occupation is whether it's customary, and certainly in the context of our city, uh, having home, oc uh, home occupation and having a uh, uh, music studio. Uh, I don't know how many uh, Tom or myself or Sean how many music people here in Nashville have represented uh, uh, putting uh, recording studios in their homes. Um, uh, again, it seems pretty obvious here in Nashville that it is, it is a customary kind of thing. No other employees, it'll just Mr. be Mr. Shaw. Uh, there's parking on the property, no signage, uh, uh, would not be any signs at all. And ultimately, because he's already there, it's already an existing residential use, he's already incorporated into the residential area, we'd suggest to the Planning Commission that there's really no adverse impact on the surrounding residential uses of the property. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. We'll save <clears throat> two minutes for your rebuttal. Uh, anyone here wishing to speak in support? Come on up. And if y'all would uh, state your name and your address, and you'll have two minutes each. Uh, my name is Kevin Kozlowskis. I live at 902 McClurkin Ave, just around the corner from Elijah Shaw. Uh, I also um, own a video production company. And uh, one of the things that makes our company special is that we procure music from local musicians. And uh, I have customers all over the country. And when I tell them that they have music made by a Nashville musician on their videos, it makes them really happy. And it gives me a competitive advantage. Um, the reason why I'm able to do that is because of home studios all over East Nashville. And um, when I need a song, I call a musician. They record record it in home studio, and then they give it to me, and I send it off to my customer. If I was not able to procure music from home studios, um, uh, I would have to be forced to either buy generic music online or go to Music Row, where there's a lot of red tape, it's super expensive, and there's politics, and I would not be able to set my company apart with having custom Nashville music for my projects. Um, Secondly and lastly, there is an enormous amount of development going on in our neighborhood right now. There are houses being put up everywhere. They're towering over my 700 square foot house and it's a big point of contention in, all over Nashville right now. And um, these, these builders litter, they park cars on neighbors' lawns. Um, there was a shootout between two employees across the street, a construction co uh, site from my house. And um, last time I checked, this isn't Construction City. This is Music City, in that all this building is being allowed to go on, but Elijah Shaw's home studio is being thwarted, is confusing to me. So I would ask that you approve his home studio so that we can continue to support local musicians, support my business, support my customers, and to export our culture to the world. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Otis Gibbs and I live at 936 Strauss Avenue. I can sit on my front porch and I can see Lidge's front porch, Elijah, uh, just right in front of me, shorter distance than this room here. And I never hear any music coming from his house at all. And I'd like to, I'm here to uh, ask you to approve his studio. And uh, there's a long-standing tradition of people recording in houses and making internationally known recordings in East Nashville, going back to Marty Robbins, the Everly Brothers, recorded in Little Hollywood. There's a, a lot of history, and um, I don't know if it was legal back then or not, Jack White, Loretta Lynn, but uh, I would like to have my neighbor be able to make a living doing what he's internationally known for. People from all over the world know Lidge, know about him. and. Um, I've lived there for nine years, and like I said, we walk our dog past his house and past where the studio would be every day. We never hear any music coming out of there at all, and uh, I ask you to approve this. And I agree with everything he said about the houses being built and torn down. I'll be sitting in my living room and hear a house come down. We've had 42 houses knocked down within a few blocks of us in just the last few years. So there's constant construction noise and the idea that Lidge is the problem with noise in my neighborhood is just ridiculous to me. So I ask you to approve. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Hello? Hi, good evening, Commissioner Atkins, fellow commissioners. First of all, thank you for your service to our great city. I am Nigel Hodge. I live at 1511 Lillian Street, but I do own property at 2406 Brasher Avenue, which is cat a corner to the applicant's property. Uh, this was a very challenging decision for me on where I came out on this because I do uh, wholeheartedly support individual property rights. Um, and I've actually talked to the property owner and, and think that he's a great neighbor and, and good to the community. However, in doing my research, which I feel my opinion is very informed, being a real estate professional, uh, speaking with various architects, I spoke to the planning staff, I uh, spoke with some neighbors um, as well. And, and really what this comes down to, it's not about the current property owner, it's about the property. And in Nashville, we talk about all the development going on. Well. This is a purely residential community. It is not, and, it, and additionally, it's not on a corner street close to any 
type of commercial offerings, any commercial businesses. Again, this area is strictly residential. We can talk about the fact that the current property owner will be mindful and respectful of the neighbors, but what, but this, if you choose to approve this SP zoning, it's not about just this property owner, it's about this property long-term. And the bottom line is an SP zoning for recording studio on a commercial use is absolutely inconsistent with the neighborhood. Uh, and it's also inconsistent with the long-term uh, land use policy, the T4 policy, which is in place to protect uh, the integrity of the neighborhood. So we, again, we can talk a lot about how Nashville is growing, so I would just urge you to protect the character of the neighborhood and think about not today, but long-term and the next property owner that may have that property. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, you got two minutes for rebuttal. I'll be very brief. Uh, and I, I understand uh, uh, the opponent's uh, point of view. Uh, one of the reasons I, I drafted uh, an ordinance to go along with the application. Uh, I don't guess you get that very often where the ordinance is actually drafted. But, uh, and wrote into the ordinance, the proposed ordinance, uh, uh, things to limit uh, the ability of having a true commercial use there, um, uh, limitations of the number of uh, uh, parking spaces, uh, employees, uh, there's none. Uh, uh, this is not the kind of thing, actually, that's going to wind up getting transferred from owner to owner. It'll be a one-shot deal, basically, because nobody's going to want to buy it under the conditions that are enclosed in the proposed ordinance. The whole idea was to uh, restrict it in such a way so that it would be a true home occupation and mesh with the overall residential use in the area. And also at the same time not allow it to grow at any time in the future in order to avoid the kinds of problems that um, uh, the gentleman just talked about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come on up. Uh, Elijah Shaw, 2407, Fresh. Um, yeah, I want to reiterate what um, George said, which is that I'm not asking for permission, for usage permission that is going to um, extend it beyond what I'm able to do now, if I was to record myself or record friends, I don't ask to bring in uh, loads of traffic or anything like that or, or change the quality of the neighborhood right there. Um, so I don't think it would extend to future owners um, using the place inappropriately for the neighborhood. Also, what wasn't mentioned is that right behind the home across the alley there is a child care facility. So there is traffic constantly going through the, the alleyway, people coming and going, and nobody's complained about that changing the character of the neighborhood from being residential to being commercial, and I don't intend to either. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing nobody else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And why don't we start, <laughs> Mr. Tibbs? Commissioner Tibbs, would you yes, like sir. to speak first? Well, I'll be glad to. Um, regarding the part that he said at the end about restrictive ordinance, because um, I, I do understand about home studios, but there, but I also do have a concern about what could happen in the future. What, how restrictive can that, or is there language that needs to be um, highlighted in what was written about the restrictions of it, so that if it, you know, he sells it next year or whatever may happen, that, you know. Looks like you got an answer for me. <clears throat> well, you can't restrict the zoning to a particular person. Uh, so if he were to sell the property, I don't think that there's a way that we can have a, a I feel confident uh, that there's no way to write a zoning regulation that is just for the current property owner. It's, uh, that would be some type of permit possibly that we don't have in existence at this time, but you couldn't do it within the, the, the zoning, the base zoning. Okay, that's what I was um, afraid of. Um, and, um, yeah, I guess that's my, my issue. I, 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 too, sympathize with it and probably, I don't know if I need to ask this question to the applicant, but, um, or if you know, if they were, how, what square footage is their studio now? And um, would this be set up where they could bring in a, full band or mini orchestra just to see what would be the maximum amount of cars that could come. I, I would defer to the applicant for that okay. information. Uh, yeah, no, come on up, the applicant and uh, 
to answer a question for the commission. <coughs> Did you understand the question? Or? I think you were asking whether I was going to have a full orchestra there. <laughs> yeah, if you could, yeah. Well, um, obviously not the Nashville Symphony, but how, <laughs> what is the square footage approximately of your um, studio? I think or it's 750 square feet as the footprint. And so, because um, what I'm trying to see is like how, what, you know, there's a home studio where there's one person that comes in because that's just the size of it, but if there's another ocean way where there's, you know. Right. Right. Um, a, a typical scenario for a home studio uh, would be to record a band, potentially, or, or just um, an artist singing with a couple of other musicians. But a band might consist of five people. So a drummer, a bass player, a, a guitar player, um, somebody play keyboards and somebody singing, you know? Yeah. So six or seven spot, potentially. Yeah, and then, you know, another consideration, too, is that um, in my neighborhood, if I work with local musicians, they would literally ride their bike over or walk over. Um, people in East Nashville regularly take an Uber or a Lyft to get to where they're going. Okay. So um, there's a, I think it would actually help with foot traffic. Okay, thanks. And help avoid, uh, you know, I wouldn't have to drive my car leaving the neighborhood as much either. Well, that's, that's better to know, um, but um, thank you, okay. appreciate it. Sorry, but, uh, a brief answer to that too. Um, the idea of an orchestra, um, a lot of times the way string section would get built in a home studio in Nashville is one, two, or three players, and they just make it sound like an orchestra. So we don't actually have tons of people. We can't okay. afford it. Thanks for that. Thanks. I've gotten a lot of education today. Um, but I still, um, I'm glad to hear that. I, I still worry about the continued since we, since it could be passed on, and uh, so that's that's my comment. Commissioner Hagen, you. Okay, from what I'm gathering, and first of all, not anti-home recording studios or anti-music. I, I think this is a, it sounds like a great idea, and I get it. I also am cognizant of our um, zoning and our, you know, what an SP should be used for. And what I'm hearing is the proper way to do this would go back to Metro Council. And my question to the advocate is, have you talked to your councilman, your councilman who is, we are very familiar with, who is here a lot, and he's not here today. Um, have you spoken to your council person about taking this to the council? Yes, we have. Okay. And this sounds like that's a more proper venue where if, it, and there's maybe support now on council, and I could defer to my council, our council lady here, that, um, you know, this has been picked up several times. It sounds like, um, that's the appropriate place. The thing is, based on the analysis from the staff, which I agree with, based on what I'm reading, it's not a proper tool to do this, and that is a commercial use. You can, if you call a duck a chicken, it's still a duck. Um, if you have customers that pay you money, it's commercial. So um, it's unfortunate, you know. I, and I'm not going to ask you if you're currently recording and getting money for it because that's none of my business. Um, just like we don't like non-conforming duplexes and we like to make sure that things happen. Um, so you have a studio and um, you should be able to use that for that purpose, but unfortunately, based on the tools we have here, that doesn't, to me, sound like we have the right tools. And council is where I would recommend you take this. Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'd ask the same question. Um, Attorney, you're taking this to the Metro Council, right? Yes, sir. And is that taking that ordinance to the council predicated on what we do tonight? If we disapprove it, it doesn't go to council. Do you have to have approval here to take it to council? Or to have support? No, this would still go to council. This is go council. this is going to go to council, but it's a <clears throat> but it's going to go to the council as a zone change, okay. as okay. opposed to a broader Understand. policy okay. issue. Okay. Well, it. it like the commissioner said, it ends up being commercial. Um, but the perfect scenario was the gentleman said his daughter lives, you know, with him, and uh, he could live at home, and that, that's kind of what these scenarios that we want, whether it's a recording studio or hairdresser or whatever. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. Uh, I'll listen to the other commissioners, but it's I'm sympathetic to it, but. 
just not sure, uh, you know, since it's commercial, but that, that'd be, I guess, up to the councilman to, they could do what they want to, so. Commissioner So, I too am very sympathetic to this. Um, and as soon as I read it, my first question is just, if you didn't have five customers, if you hadn't openly stated five customers a day would be coming here, then it seems like it would be an approved use. Um, but obviously it's better to be in compliance than not in compliance. Um, and, I, and I do think I agree with, I'm not an attorney by any means, but I agree with the um, staff interpretation of you know how we're supposed to use specific plans and what the purpose of it is. Um, but yeah, so I would defer as well to the council lady to just see, I mean, is it, it seems to me in five years with this emphasis on the creatives in Nashville, like if there is a time to take this up at council, this, this should be it. We're promoting entrepreneurship, we're promoting, promoting creative placemaking. So this is all part of that. I don't want him to be left out, but I also agree that this is not the right approach from a truly planning perspective. Mr. Clifford. One of the <clears throat> first um, issues I got involved with on the council was to uh, oppose an effort to expand non-strictly residential use in our neighborhoods. Uh, <clears throat> and unfortunately, I guess at this point, I might as well publicly state that Buck Dozier was right and I was wrong. <laughs> but please don't tell him that. Because uh, he thought we should and I thought it was a travesty. Uh, I've since realized, living in urban neighborhoods, that when it's owner-occupied and subject to um, vigilant neighborhood associations and whatnot, that it is it makes our neighborhoods safer and more diverse to have people who can make a living in their homes. Um, and I had I've been on the council at least two or three of these last times people have tried to do this through a tax change, I probably would have voted for it. Um, and this new council, I, I hear they even have people who know something about music on the council, although he's not listening to me at the moment. But um, I'm not sure either that I can vote for this, though, because it's a little ad hoc. And I realize that's part of the charm of it, because it means it won't be on everybody's neighborhood, uh, everybody's block. Um, on the other hand, it's... It can't transfer to anyone else for a different kind of use if this goes through. If it happened to go through and we happen to approve a, I think this commission would have to approve a policy amendment if we wanted to do that. This SP speaks to the use that would be there as a recording studio. And so it would just be as a recording studio. They couldn't turn it into, say, right. a hairdresser. But well. he could sell his home to another person who wanted to do exactly what he did. So in that sense, it can't be limited just to him. No. Because it, it runs with the property. Right. Uh, anyway, I, I, I actually think there's an awful lot of, I mean, we all kind of know that there are studios in use now. Uh, it's just a matter of he wanted to do it legally, which is kind of sad to turn down. I don't know. I'm actually torn by this. I do realize that that there's this issue of how we use our SP capacity uh, a tool and that this is not a normal use for SP. Um, I actually think a city that has learned to live with chickens, which I was a big supporter of as well, uh, ought to be able to live with recording studios. But, we uh, should. So I'm going to listen to the rest of this discussion, <laughs> as they say. Commissioner Mike. Yeah. So this is a question for staff. So if, the, if we find that it's not in conformance with the policy, then we are, I mean, our hands are tied. I mean, we can't, I mean, we can't recommend approval for something that's not in conformance with the policy. Is that right? That's correct. If you agree with staff's interpretation that it's not in conformance with policy, I would argue that yes. there are other policy considerations that well, and that's you might consider. One question I had, 
So, and I'm not sure this is an actual distinction, but I thought it was interesting the attorney for the applicant mentioned he was distinguishing a commercial use um, as compared to a home occupation use. I mean, is that, I mean, is that really a distinction in use or is that pretty much the same thing? I mean, if we were trying to think about ways how this could be in compliance with the policy, it, because it's not a true commercial use, it's a home occupation use. Is that just literally just different words but it means the exact same thing? So according to the Metro Code, this wouldn't fit the definition of a home occupation accessory use because he is serving clients and patrons. Who come to, his, who come to the actual Right. Clinic. So that's why it wouldn't be technically a home occupation because he does have people coming there. It's just not just him. So, well, I mean, I guess that pretty much clears it up for me if, if I thought that there was a way to kind of manipulate it and to be in conformance with the policy. I, 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 maybe if someone else. There. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe someone else in the commission can figure out a way to um, make the argument, but I don't see how there is a way to say that it's in conformance with the policy um, when you have people coming and it, it seems to be a commercial use. So um, it seems like. It seems like, in my opinion, our hands are tied, but and it is a shame because I think it would be a nice thing for you to be able to do. Commissioner Diaz, hold on one second. Uh, there was a question. Yeah, from I don't want to re-argue what I said, but I do want to ask a question. We, we very often recommend things that at the beginning of the meeting are contrary to our policy, but we do it in tandem with the recommended amendment, don't we, to our policy? It has to be proposed. I've never voted against our policy, but maybe you have, Stuart. <laughs> I have voted. Chairman, I, I'm not sure that's I, what he was saying. I have, <laughs> uh, I have voted uh, uh, for changes that would have been contrary to our policy had we not also adopted an amendment yeah. at the same meeting, which well, I suppose is an issue we could pursue at some point, or perhaps we simply, um, maybe, Ms., uh, maybe Mr. Sloan was referring to some policy that it does fall under. That, that is correct, Chairman, mm -hmm. I mean, Commissioner, <clears throat> is that the, the home occupation, uh, home businesses like the one that we're talking about right now, home recording studios of limited size and uh, with other types of limitations regarding signage and uh, number of customers, uh, there are uh, certainly policies within Nashville Next that we could point to that that those would encourage. Um, and so, while a you know strict interpretation of our land use policy regarding how we use residential property, just in that narrow focus, is not supported by it's not supported by our policies, right? But the larger goals of Nashville Next, it wouldn't be very hard to imagine how this type of use at this scale would achieve some of our greater goals. And we probably would be able to articulate that. But, but let me point out one other thing, that, that we as a staff, and when we're giving recommendations to this body, a couple of things that we always try to keep in, in mind is, one, the decisions that y'all make. And so our recommendations oftentimes will evolve as the discussion at, at, at this table evolves. Uh, and, you know, uh, down zoning to single family from uh, our zone properties, that's evolved back and forth over time. And, and our recommendations have changed as well. I wouldn't understate, I can't overstate how much the history behind this issue, as you've now alluded to, and as Sean pointed out in her presentation, was a great part uh, uh, deciding how we get, what our recommendation was. Uh, because we've run head first into this wall a number of times and have been told by the council, no, home businesses aren't appropriate. And so uh, that probably uh, colored our uh, recommendation even more than some of uh, the greater goals of Nashville Next. Commissioner Diaz. Thank you. I think that clarified a lot of things for me. Um, I agree with a lot of the commissioners that this seems like a larger issue and 
um, it's something that I think if he wants to do, I'm sure other people will want to do. So I think um, it would open an opportunity for a lot of um, Nashvilleans and entrepreneurs to kind of, you know, make our future be more in line with what Nashville Next, our greater goals are for Nashville Next. Um, however, I, I agree also with Commissioner Blackshear that we cannot, I don't believe we can actually approve this because I don't, I don't think it complies with the policy, this specific policy. And even though Nashville Next does encourage um, home occupancy and like home businesses, there are policies that allow that for that reason. And because of the location, so if it's in a corner or a neighborhood center or neighborhood evolving maybe, but since this is in a neighborhood maintenance policy, I think it contradicts what um, this SP is trying to achieve. So I agree with staff and I think um, with everyone else that this should this sounds like something that we could maybe talk about as a city and it would benefit a lot more people if we could, you know, move towards something that we could all agree on that maybe we could get a home business um, definition or something like that. Council Anna. Thank you. So I, I was on the council in 2012 when we went through this the first time. It's, it's possible since we've had the Nashville Next conversation that sentiment is beginning to change. I mean, we certainly have seen a lot more live work uh, opportunities be created, and I think people have in general been very excited about those. Um, so I, I think it's certainly worth keeping the conversation going on, on a broad policy level. I would, uh, Ms. Logan and I have had conversations about what in Nashville Next does address this, and can I put you on the spot sure. and ask if you can sure. point that out? There is a specific action in Nashville Next under um, workforce development that says create rules that allow home-based businesses in existing neighborhoods without disrupting the character and enjoyment of those neighborhoods. So even on a countywide scale, we'd be looking for something that was limited um, beyond some of the terms that are in this SP. Yeah, so I mean, to get back to the policy question, it has it has been discussed at least at the Nashville Next level that within the confines of not being disruptive to the neighborhood, and that's that's the key word, you know. And again, if if it doesn't involve many cars and it, you can't hear it from the street ever, um, those clearly would fit within those guidelines. So, all that being said, I mean, I agree with the other commissioners that that. Um, I certainly appreciate the uh, the applicant trying to do this the legal way. Good, good for him. Um, and I, I certainly appreciate the fact that that so much great music has come out of Nashville, out of home recording studios um, that apparently have not disrupted anybody because it's not something that I think we get a lot of complaints about. So we're in, uh, to me, sort of an interesting situation of benefiting tremendously from having them here without actually ever being able to acknowledge that they're really here. Um, you know, this being somebody who's trying to sort of come out into the open and um, and and work within the the context of the law. Unfortunately, as we've all said, we, we're not sure we have a tool that will enable us to do that. Um, but I think that it's great the conversation continues to go on. And I, I guess I would ask if within this, the new things that we've created with regard to live work, are those all in industrial zones, or have any of those? been in any kind of our, yeah, make, yeah the maker, maker space and all those types of things. Do any of those give us tools that might be useful? In the code, there's no definition of live work. All of those have happened under specific SPs that have been in policies that allow some amount of commercial, gotcha. like mixed-use neighborhood. Okay. That's not the maker. The maker zoning that was put into sure. place last year? What that did was allow some semi-industrial uses um, when they're maker-specific in more commercially zoned areas, okay. as well as allow them to have some residential uses in industrial areas so that they could have live work in industrial areas where the residential would not be allowed. So it's the opposite. <laughs> okay. But it's the beginning of the transition, which seems to be working out. Um, 
So that being said, I'm not sure I'm saying anything new that anybody else has said, ex except that we went through this very difficult discussion in, in 2012. There were a lot of reasonable things that were thrown out there. At that point in our history, there was still a, a very strong protection of neighborhoods. And there's something else going on right now, y'all may or may not be aware of, that is similar. Um, <laughs> that is also very protective of... Yeah, we get trade those, yeah. Um, so I, I hesitate to jump in and say, oh, I am sure we can change the policy and I'll take it to council tomorrow. Um, but I sure want to keep the discussion going because I think, I think it's dishonest for Nashville not to acknowledge that this is a huge part of what makes us a terrific city and a lot of great things have come out of it. Um, well, and uh, I do want to say, uh, I usually don't make a lot of comments, Council Lady, but I do want to say this commission voted like the history said, and we want to be crystal clear that the problem is not this particular commission. It is, um, I don't want to blame the council, but it is the council. Um, you know, <laughs> and so I think it's clear that we've been on record for home recording studios, and I don't want the applicant leaving thinking that the planning commission is the big bad person, but under our current policy, it's really hard for us to adopt this specific proposal for an SP, and it doesn't seem right for us. So I just, at least that's what I'm getting from everyone in, in my own mind, and I just want to be crystal clear that we are Music City, um, but this planning commission is not opposed to home recording studios generally. I want to, I'll speak for myself since we didn't vote. Um, maybe not everybody here voted for that, but I remember voting for it. I even remember having music played um, right here. Someone yes. play, you all you remember that. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important, you know, that the council really does consider it. And, and I know, Council Lady, if, if you would, we'll ask you to be the sponsor or something, right? You do it. <laughs> I know you'll find I'm a sponsor such a great or something. Um, right now, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but it's been a good discussion. So we do, um, Council Lady, we do need a motion, or is there another, any other discussion? Let me ask one other question. Oh, yes, ma'am. Is, is there any flexibility within the definition of client, customer, or whatever, or the possibility? Because my understanding of the home occupation bill allows one employee, but no clients. Um, does that provide any flexibility? And I don't know what you call people who come to record, if they're, if they're your clients or they're just somebody, you, they're a contractor that you hire or whatever. Does, does, does the opportunity to say one contractor at a time fits in the definition of a home occupation? Um, the code, when it refers to home occupation, specifically says no clients or patrons may be served on the property. That's the and those words are all defined. Client patron served, as opposed to I'm hiring you as a contractor to record this one piece for somebody. Hmm. I doubt those terms are, are defined in, in the same. Okay, just, I'm just, I'm trying to be creative here. Sure. So I think I'm being asked very regretfully. No, no Stuart has more to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have a lot more, I just think it's been an interesting discussion that could benefit from two more weeks of thought and uh, Mr. Dean coming up with a possible solution or two for us to think about at the next meeting. So um, you wanna, you it might be a bad idea, but uh, I would at the right time um, perhaps make such a motion. To defer to one defer meeting. for one meeting, if that were seen as a good idea by people. Just check one real quickly. Has this been filed at the council? No. Okay. So. Okay. No. All right. This may not do anything, but I'll, I'll make a motion we defer for one meeting. And that is to clarify on these definitions to see if there's another opportunity for this use of that location? Or, or to limit in some way that we haven't thought of to make it uh, more uh, in line with closer our to our policy or, or perhaps even have potential words for a modification of policy if we needed to. That's a proper motion. There's a second. Any more? Just, just a question. Hold on, one at a time. Chairman and then uh, Mr. Tibbs. The uh, motion to <clears throat> close the public hearing or to leave it open? Oh, I think we need to leave it open. I really do. If we're, if we're contemplating something new that hasn't been noticed. Yeah, yeah well, just a clarification. We'd have to, we, since we've closed it, we'd have to reopen. Yeah, but we'll we state would. that as part of the motion right. if we get to that point, Mr. Tibb, Commissioner Tibb. Just could you clarify that, your motion one more time, just uh, so I can be, is that okay? 
Well, I don't I, know. I just didn't really understand. You want the language. Usually Jessica does that. No. But, uh, <laughs> I wanted to defer it. Uh, my motion was to defer so that we could have more carefully considered language about the general subject raised and the potential for for word words that might words related to a policy amendment as well if that's needed. Right. I don't like that. Can I say to add to that, thinking through that, you know, it, it's it's about it seems to me that the, the issue is is the fact that you're serving clients who are actually physically there, right? So if you were, think of it this way, if he has a recording studio and he's doing digital recording and someone is connecting with him digitally, he could make money, so have a commercial activity with a patron that he's serving, but they're not physically there. And that's a question of whether that would be something you'd be allowed to do. And so... You could do that now. That would be home... It's home, home occupation. occupation. So, because you can have commercial, you can have commercial use as long as there's no one physically there with you. But that, so that, I mean, I, I am all and in favor of trying to figure something out because it seems like he should be able to go forward doing this legally. But what we're basically coming up with is trying to figure out that he's in conformance with being a home occupation. At the end of the day, it would not be that we're at that point. We would not need a specific plan if we determined that he was a qualifying home occupation. And I don't. Know I, I think I can. can I think I can that. safely say that we're not going to be able to get there. Right. I don't think we can do that. So, as much as I like the idea of deferring, and I'm not sure that because we're going with a specific plan, we're ever going to be able to find that the specific plan is the way to go forward with this. That's, that's so the question is just: Is there more that we could do? to move this forward, or do we just need to say this is not the tool and figure out a way to move this forward as a policy? And it, I, I would agree with you. I, is that the vehicle uh, to get to where I, I hear, the, I believe I hear the commission saying that they would like for us to fashion uh, a way for this type of use in limited circumstances, I don't think is this SP. I don't think that's the vehicle. Uh, but a, but a greater policy um, discussion and, uh, and trying to draft something to at least present to the council uh, as something they might move forward with is probably, I think, a more appropriate. Uh, but that would be independent of this specific It, it would be independent of this SP. So it... it, it I, you know, I, I, would, I would really hesitate in expanding what SPs are right. uh, to become right. this sort of uh, tool for home businesses. Yeah, I think from a precedent perspective, we don't want to get down that road. All right, let's make sure. Uh, Commissioner Tibbs, did you get your answer? You, yeah, your just question. Question. Okay, okay, perfect. Right. One other question. You may be right, we may not be able to get there from here. The, because it may, it, it, the change in the language of, of this proposal might be beyond the scope of this caption. I mean, I'm thinking in terms of state law that you can't amend beyond this, beyond the caption. Um, what I'm saying is these these bills cost money to file. I mean, these these actions do, and if it's something that conceivably could be fixed by some modification of language, if in fact it can't be, and he has to start over, then that's that's that. You know what I'm saying? Is it some, is it? I do, and, and if you defer, then we'll take the time and we'll sit down and we'll look at it and we'll see if there's a possibility. Under uh, this? Under this. Um, yeah, you just are doubtful. I'm doubtful, uh, but I would say that, you know, that this conversation here, again, just like I said about the, the way that we consider y'all's decisions on various issues and the commission and the council's decision, uh, I've heard something very different today than what I've seen in the council's actions, not necessarily this body. Council. And so uh, we'll certainly take another look at it and see if there's that opportunity. So is there a motion to defer or is, is there a motion? There? I think we have a motion to defer. Well, we never got a second on that. Second. So I we, did, yeah. there, oh, there we go. See, I'm wrong. Chair takes his statement back. <laughs> there was a proper motion and a second, and, and uh, we'll look at those definitions. Um, any more discussion? Got a vote on it. All in favor? Of deferring one meeting, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. Oh. Well, all right, so all in favor of deferring one meeting, raise your hand. 
those in up. Well, let me count. Hold on, let's do this <laughs> count. Six. Six. six, all right. Opposed? Three, six, three. Um, motion's deferred. The, not the motion, the, the bill is deferred. One meeting. Either, Item. <laughs> Let's make sure we are on track here. We are on item number 23. <laughs> Mr. White? Uh, hold on, We're in your, your microphone's not on. Okay. Tom White, 315 Dedrick Street. Just a point of information, would like to ask the commission to consider putting number 35 back on the consent agenda. It was on consent. Two people came down here today. Uh, they didn't have the correct information. We've met with them over the last period of time. They've withdrawn uh, their objection. They're now in support. They've left. I told them I'd report this to the chair and ask if we could put that back uh, on consent. All right, Mr. White, uh, we can, if without objection, we can, is there objection to the request? Yes, I will. Uh, are there, is there anyone here in opposition to item 35? All right. And so is there, let's go, so commissioners, um, there's been a request to put item 35 back on the consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion to do so? Sorry. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Item 35 is back on the consent agenda as approved on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. White. We are on item 23. All right, the next item, item 23, is a request to change the zoning on property at 3233 Knobview Drive um, from residential single family RS20 to specific plan mixed use. The subject property is highlighted in red. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. The existing zoning on the property is RS20, which is residential um, intended for single family dwellings with a minimum lot size of 20,000 square feet. The land use policy for this property is T3 Suburban Neighborhood Maintenance, which is a residential only policy intended to preserve the general character of existing suburban neighborhoods. The addition of a commercial use in this location is not supported by the policy. Similar to the last item, this is a regulatory SP proposal to permit a hair salon in addition to the uses allowed by the RS20 zoning. You can see the standards proposed in the SP on the screen. Um, much like the last item, this cannot meet the definition of a home occupation in the zoning code because there will be clients served on site. This is a familiar list of bills. Um, at this time, I would draw your attention to the first one, which was a previous attempt to allow exactly um, this use as a home occupation use with some clients. Um, again, these were unable to gain support. Um, and so, because um, home-based businesses may support goals of the general plan, but they're not consistent with the policy, the current definition of home occupation, um, and this is not an appropriate use of the SP tool in staff's estimation, um, we would recommend disapproval. Thank you. We'll open this item up for public hearing. Is the applicant here? Should we just re-record your... Uh, uh, yeah, in, in a manner of speaking, but there are some significant differences here that okay. may affect the way the Planning Commission looks at it. Um, uh, George Dean, uh, 315 Dedrick Street, uh, between Dedrick and White, on behalf of the applicant, uh, Pat Rayner. Um, uh, it, it is, in theory, very similar to the previous case. Um, uh, the structure is already there. In fact, the hair salon is already there. One of the differences is that in this particular case, Ms. Rayner had used this and did, did not understand it was a violation of codes, uh, was picked up by the codes department and cited. It's been a number of years back and the, the activity has been ceased since that time. Uh, but she came to us and asked if we could look at it as part of doing this with um, uh, Mr. Shaw. So uh, that, that's a difference. I'll also mention that uh, Councilman Syracuse, I think, was here in the beginning. I don't know if he's still, but is it, he, he's, he's, I've spoken with him. He is against the proposal. So that will certainly have an impact at the council. Um, uh, at the same time, I want, my, my client wanted to go forward, and, and so I'm here today. Let me just take two minutes, run through my uh, uh, speech from before. 
but I think the, those two facts probably have an impact on uh, uh, what the planning commission may look at this. Um, as I said, there's no, no required changes in the structure. The, the, it's a residential structure. Uh, the actual hair salon is already there. It's about 500 square feet, about 20% of the uh, existing structure. Uh, the idea, similar to the previous bill that was uh, withdrawn, is to allow basically a, a customer at a time. Uh, would be limited to um, uh, a few customers a day, uh, uh, six or so. Uh, only Ms. Rayner would operate the facility. Uh, she has a state license. The facility would have to be uh, uh, pursuant to state regulation. It would also have to be uh, uh, licensed. The, um, uh, let me conclude really by just making this statement I said last time, and that is that the, from, from the reason I was interested in looking into this was knowing of the problems we've had in the past trying to go on a countywide basis that in some areas where there were residential uh, uses that have very limited home occupation, even serving people on site, it seemed to me made some sense. Um, uh, this again is a very uh, limited home occupation, one person uh, we'll have one client there. Basically, they may overlap. Somebody may come 10 minutes early, and the next, and then the next uh, one leave. But the um, uh, use of the property would be extremely limited, with very few people on site. Um, uh, again, it's incidental. The way the law looks at these things is: are they customarily incidental to and subordinate to the um, uh, principal use of the property? Principal use here is residential, not commercial. It's residential. Uh, uh, the size of the uh, part of the property that would be used for the hair salon is, as I say, uh, much smaller than the remaining part of the property. Uh, and again, uh, these kinds of facilities have customarily been in residential areas uh, uh, ac across the country, for that matter. Um, uh, there is par parking easily on the property for folks to come in. Um, the uh, uh, she did ask for one small directional sign that um, could be put less than two square feet, basically, just a, a directional. Uh, and ultimately, again, from, from our perspective, the uh, impact on the surrounding land uses in this residential area would be extremely limited. Um, uh, it's an existing house. She lives there. Uh, she would provide uh, the service to a customer at a time uh, as they came. Um, with that, uh, uh, by the way, there, there, she has some neighbors that were here. I think we've lost them <laughs> as the time has gone by, but I just wanted to, to make that. And uh, uh, she may want to speak. I, she was, this is Ms. Rayner here. Uh, uh, when I talked to her earlier, she preferred me to just uh, make the pitch. Uh, so uh, unless you have questions, certainly she's here and she'd be glad to answer any questions that the commission might have. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, I'm Pat Rayner. Um, I just want to say this is an extremely small business. I need to work through retirement because I can't retire. And the only way I can continue to work would be to be with a very low overhead. As you know, when you're in a commercial space, you have a lot of overhead. I'm not going to be able to do that. As I get older, I'm not going to be able to work as much, but I still need to work. I will always work. That's just the way it is. So I'm asking you just to consider the fact that I could do this very small scale. Actually, there doesn't need to be signage. I already have a clientele. I've been working for years. They, I'm not looking for new clientele. No walk-ins, none of that. There will be no signs. That's not what I'm wanting. It's a personal business that I have and have had for a long time. Anybody that I would have come to my home to give a service to, I would invite in my home. As it is now, all the neighbors, all of the neighbors in my cul-de-sac and across the street, people in the neighborhood are okay with it. I'm sure there's some that aren't, but the majority are. And another thing, <clears throat> actually the big majority of my neighborhood are my clients. So, you know, they certainly, <laughs> would be, uh, nobody would object, I don't think, to having them come to my home. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll reserve two minutes for a rebuttal. You're welcome. All right, anyone uh, wishing to speak in support? Come on up. 
and state your name and your address. Anyone wishing to anyone wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. State your name and. Hey, my name is Terry Crotzer. I live at 3212 Knobview, right up the street. Um, I don't think anyone's against folks making a living. This is truly commercial. Number of people coming in. It's how you're going to regulate the number that comes in. I don't live in a commercial neighborhood. I live in a residential neighborhood. My family's lived in that neighborhood since before I was born. Residential. Let's keep it residential. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Councilman, you want to speak now or after the rebuttal? You just, uh, it's up to you. After the rebuttal, sure. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's... There's not really... Uh, no, I, unless I, you, I just assume... All right, here we go, Mr. Councilman. We wave the rebuttal. Thank you, Chair, Commissioners, Council Lady. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm a very pragmatic man, um, and I've had many conversations with Ms. Rayner about this. Um, I've explained ad nauseum about where we are as far as a home-based business, working with the short-term rentals, the home studio issue, of course, is very interesting to me, being in the, in the industry for 20 years. Um, but as it comes down to it, we don't have a, a policy for this yet. And your commentary on the last uh, case was, I think, spot on, that the DSP is not an appropriate use uh, for, for, for this kind of thing. And so I don't plan on even, even sponsoring this bill. So I, I've, I've explained to, to Pat that uh, I'm pragmatic. After we get through the STRP issue, could we revisit this as some sort of policy? I'm open to those discussions, but as it stands right now, this is not an appropriate use in this neighborhood. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. How about we start with Commissioner Blackshear? We haven't, I haven't started with you. And since you've made partner, you know, I feel like I should have done it earlier. <laughs> Thanks. So congratulations on that, by the way, yes. out of order. Sorry. Um, Commissioner Blackshear. <laughs> Um, well, I feel like we've had this conversation. Um, I will say, even though it's Music City, I probably am more sympathetic to a hair salon owner. Um, but I, I don't, I just don't see, based on um, our prior discussion, I don't see how um, I could get to a place where I think this is something that um, we could or should approve as a planning commission body. And I wasn't in favor of deferring the last um, item we heard because I thought it's not something that we could or should um, support as a planning commission body. Um, and I, but I am very sympathetic to the, um, to the homeowner and to the salon owner. And I, I want her to be able to carry on her business. I'm just not sure that we, as a planning commission, have the appropriate tools to allow her to do that. And the fact that the councilman's not in support of it does not plan on sponsoring the bill, I mean, that's also very telling, too. So. Thank you. And instead of going around, is there any other commissioners that want to speak on this issue? So, um, well, um, only just Mr. Fact, Tibbs. I obviously um, didn't support the last one that was SP, but um, I almost feel like we, uh, it's the same thing. We almost have to find a way to do that deferral again. It's kind of, we've opened this up now. I'm, on the other commission I do, we talk a lot about precedent and we've, we've made a precedent now and we can't, I just feel like, well, that planning commission is good for um, music business, but don't you come in with anything else? So, so I guess I don't know that language that we did for that just uh, to defer, but I think we, you know, unless we want to say this is how you are with this business, we need to do that. It would I, I didn't make do sense. that one, so I don't know the exact words we did, but. It would make sense that we would, um, this is almost an identical item, while it is a different type of use. And, you, you know, but we should at least um, give probably um, the same deferral and, and, and look at those, that home-based definition. So, Chairman? Or yeah, just, just for information, not particularly voting one way or the other or changing the mind one way or the other, but have we approved other home occupations within Metro ever? I'm not familiar with anything like this where we've used an SP to allow uh, home business. There's none, none exists in 
that we're I, I can't I can't get I can't say permitted. with absolute certainty that well, in nowhere in the 560 permitted. square miles of Davidson County do we have a home but business. The question is but, permitted. Uh, but but I, I, don't, I don't think so that I can think because I can't think of a permit that you would have that would allow you to do that at a home. Permit. Gary looks anxious to speak. Well, I was just going to add that we have approved some live work units in SPs that have a neighborhood center or commercial policy, so not in the okay. residential so the, area. Okay, policy difference. Right. Yeah, okay. That, that was what I wanted to clear. Chairman, I, it is odd, of course, that these are you, that these would be treated differently. I am convinced the more we talk that, you know, in this kind of a setting, the SP really can't be legitimately used. Um, I, my hope was that a, a, the deferral would allow for some refinement before people lock down uh, on the whole idea. Uh, and maybe maybe this SP, this this number can't be used. These two two item numbers can't be used either is what I'm sort of hearing, but I, I do want to agree that the kind of method we used to get there is important and the SP is, just doesn't no, feel right. right. But um, I just think that some creative thought going into, into it might get it in some kind of a situation that it could be looked at eventually at the council, but I'm not sure about either one of them. Mr. Director, do you have a suggestion? Just, just something real quick. Is it? I agree, but uh, but frankly, and uh, as Catherine uh, indicated to me while we were discussing this, it's probably not going to. We're not going to be able to come up with that in a week. Uh, that or even two weeks. Uh, fair enough. Uh, double the time. It's still not going to get us there. I don't think. Uh, I think it takes. Uh, a community conversation, and I and I agree with the council lady. I think we've evolved in our thought process about different types of uses in different areas, um, and uh, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Diaz points out a, a, a good point that you know what the policy is in that area really matters. Is it neighborhood evolving? Is it neighborhood maintenance? Uh, so all of that needs to be taken into consideration as well as a community discussion, uh, and I just don't think that. These is, I think, uh, Commissioner Clifton was just pointing out that maybe these two aren't the right avenue to get there, and and certainly I don't believe that an SP is the right tool. So, well, I will remind the commission. You know, we do take a lot of we try to create precedents, and so I think with the last one we did create some procedural precedents, and so I'd probably urge us to um, defer this one meeting with the other to look and see we're just we're just asking for a deferral we don't think as the the executive director said we don't think that we can get there maybe but that i think a, a deferral being consistent with the last um, policy would be very good thing otherwise we'd be treating two very similar things differently so i would urge that motion any more discussion or is there a motion to defer for one to one meeting from the same person that I'll, made the original. I'll jump out there and throw myself in there with Stuart. <laughs> Commissioner Clifton, because I appreciate him keeping the conversation going because I think this is very complicated. I would I would move for one meeting deferral with the with the um, intent to continue to look for ways to keep this conversation about live work and home occupation. And looking at the policy. And looking at policy going. Let's see if it fits. All right. We, it's just basically the same motion as the previous and item. Second, like it is. There we go. There's been a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All in favor of a one meeting deferral say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Yes, no. Oh. <laughs> it's the same vote, isn't it? Let's see. It's six to three. I voted deferral. He voted deferral. To be consistent. Oh. To be consistent. All right, let's 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 not muddy up the record. All in favor of the deferral, raise your hand. So one, two, seven to two. All right. Thank you. All right, now we are on to item. Which items? We are on item twenty-five. Item 25. 
You get the All same right. pay either way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The next item is item 25. This is a request to apply a historic bed and breakfast homestay overlay on property located at 2808 Belmont Boulevard. This is at the corner of Belmont Boulevard and Kirkwood Avenue. The property is highlighted in red. Staff recommendation is to approve. The current zoning on the property is R8, which is intended for one and two family dwellings with a minimum 8,000 square foot lot size. This property is also within the Belmont Hillsborough Neighborhood Conservation District. The request is to apply a historic bed and breakfast homestay overlay, which is defined as a building with three or fewer guest rooms for pay within a private owner occupied historically significant structure. The policy in this area is T4 Urban Neighborhood Maintenance, which is intended to preserve the general character of existing urban neighborhoods. Uh, in evaluating whether to apply the bed and breakfast homestay overlay, there are criteria that the property has to meet. These are um, evaluated by the Metro Historic Commission and they make a recommendation to this body regarding the proposal. Um, these criteria are all related to the historic significance of the structure. And the Metro Historic Zoning Committee recommended approval of this at their meeting on January 18th. There are also a number of conditions that have to be met to establish the bed and breakfast use itself um, that deal with owner occupancy, the maximum length of stay, parking, signs, um, maintenance of a guest register, those types of things. Those are reviewed as part of a, a permit issued for the use through the Metro Codes Department. So since the Historic Zoning Commission has recommended approval due to the historic significance of the home and because this is consistent with the neighborhood maintenance policy, staff recommends approval. Thank you. Um, we'll open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? You will have 10 minutes and can hold two minutes back for rebuttal. Okay, thank you. Uh, Adam Carter, 2810 Belmont Boulevard. And first of all, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Australia Day. Um, so we applied for the, uh, we bought the, the um, property on 2808 Belmont Boulevard midway through last year with the intent to uh, turn it into a historic bed and breakfast. And we do believe that we meet, uh, as Sean suggested, that we meet all the criteria as far as owner occupancy, um, Maximum of three bedroom. Uh, there is off-street parking that's already there. Uh, I'm really not coming up with anything that anyone would disagree with. As far as um, historic is concerned, they have uh, approved uh, for the overlay. And uh, as far as pass you know, passing fire and, and health department, that's, that's yet to come. But uh, I'm gonna keep this brief because I think we've uh, pretty much met every criteria. Thank you. Um, is there anyone here that's speaking in support of the project? Anybody speaking in opposition? Please come on up and state your name and address. You'll have two minutes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I'm not really here to oppose. I'm here because I'm a neighbor and I wasn't here for the first meeting. I had no information. I, um, my name is Peggy Dugman. I own, since 1980, a nine-unit building across the street. I'm a hands-on manager. I've had problems with my off-the-street parking. I've had to have cars towed. So I want to make sure that we have Please. adequate parking for this um, bed and breakfast. It is a residential area. My building is legally non-conforming and I'm, I'm a preservationist. I'd like to see the area maintained with the historical integrity that it currently has. So again, I'm not here to oppose it, but I'm here to support what I hear is being put there. The last time I came to a similar meeting, it was to listen to someone present an idea to put a guest house in the back. I did not oppose it, and they, they constructed 
a um, recording studio two feet from my property, <laughs> and that's what it's been used for ever since. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Can you um, give us your address? I know you said across the street. It's um, 2804-06 Belmont Boulevard. It's on Great. the corner of, of uh, Kirkwood and Belmont. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else speaking in opposition? Would the applicant like to use your two minutes for rebuttal? Sure. Just to allay any fears uh, as to parking, there are already two parking pads on site. Uh, there is room for a third if we need to add that. Um, and as, as far as the, the um, requirements or the restrictions on parking for this particular overlay, it's a maximum of one per unit. Uh, so it would be a maximum of three. We already have two on site. Um, we also, uh, so, so we meet that criteria as well. Okay. Um, if that's the only concern, I think that sums it up. Okay, thank you. Declare the public hearing closed. And um, Council Lady, this is your district. Yeah, thank you. I'll, 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 just, I'll start as the council member. We did have a community meeting earlier, and I apologize if, uh, if we tend to rely too much on emails and listservs and you didn't get the word that way, um, Ms. Dedman, we uh, will try to remember to do flyers in the future. Um, there were... Uh, several neighbors who, who did come to that. We did discuss parking and, and had the same answer at that point um, and discuss the historic character of the of the home. I mean, it's it's a historic neighborhood, so it's it's one of many. Um, and I think after after a good discussion about concerns with issues, the, the neighbors who had were at that meeting were, were satisfied. The Neighborhood Association has also discussed it and um, decided not to take a stand either in opposition or support, um, but they are aware of the project as well. Um, so I have uh, I feel like the owners have, have worked hard to um, to do their di due diligence. They have have certainly uh, worked with people as they have discovered ones that they hadn't talked to already, but I, I think they have tried to contact everyone that, that they're aware of. Um, so I think that it is an appropriate use, um, and certainly um, the sentiment is that if the owner is on site, it, it makes a huge difference, which is a very specific part of this. So, okay, um, so I'd appreciate c careful consideration. Thank you very much. Are there any other commissioners that um, have any comments or questions on this one? Well, you know, I, I actually do, and I, I, I never say anything. So it's oh, unusual okay. for me to have something to say. But, Don't start now, please. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say that over the years there have been a lot of efforts to create ways to um, to have uh, bed and breakfast and to have and to do historic preservation. And back back before we even had broad historic neighborhoods. Um, the council around the early 90s created the bed and breakfast homestay, which is much more specific than, than um, many other things, uh, including the sort of, uh, you know, the, the historic wedding places and stuff. And there has been one in this district within blocks of where he's proposing for a long time without any hint of a complaint, unless I'm wrong, because we so I just wanted to throw that in. Uh, I, th I think it's been a successful, although not used a lot, but a successful way to 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 um, to, to use a historic home uh, without causing problems to neighbors. Okay. Can I make a motion to approve as um, as staff recommended? Use a second. Sorry. Okay. Lots of seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion. motion passes. All right, thank you so much, Vice Chair. We are on item 31.
Good evening, commissioners. My name is Jessica Beekler. Item 31 on the agenda is the Whites Creek at Lloyd Road Urban Design Overlay. The request, the request is to apply an urban design overlay to the properties outlined in red. They are located along Clarksville Pike, Buena Vista Pike, Dry Fork Road, and Lloyd Road. Planning staff's recommendation is to approve the urban design overlay. The current zoning is single family residential RS10 and RS15. The current policy is conservation, T2 rural, rural maintenance, which is intended to preserve the rural character, and T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance, which is intended to preserve the general character of suburban residential neighborhoods. The proposed UDO is consistent with policy because the standards are in line with the character of suburban residential neighborhood design. As a reminder, here are key things to note regarding urban design overlays. A UDO is a zoning tool that applies regulatory design standards over a given area. The design standards contained in a UDO do not replace the base zoning, but have the same force and effect as base zoning. Also, a UDO is used to protect the existing character or create a new character of a given area. To note, the UDO would not control lot layout should a parcel be subdivided. The creation of new lots would follow the typical subdivision process. The standards in the proposed UDO were developed by the local community to ensure that future development is generally consistent with the existing and desired character of the neighborhood. The UDO contains standards to regulate residential building and site design and architectural design. The UDO regulates the eave height at 22 feet maximum and the roof ridge line height at 37 feet maximum of the primary building to ensure a desired building form. The frontage width requires the front facade of buildings to, to be minimum 45% of the lot width or 25 feet, whichever is greater. Also, buildings are required to have their main entrance be oriented to the primary street frontage. In addition to standards for the primary building, the UDO proposes standards for garages and accessory structures. If the location of an accessory structure is visible from the street, it must be screened with landscaping. The footprint of an accessory structure, including a detached garage, shall be less than 50% of the primary building. Garages shall be detached and located behind the primary building or attached and accessed from the side or rear. Driveways are limited to one curb cut per, pre per street frontage. Corner lots are only allowed one. Architectural design standards include requirements for building materials and openings or glazing. The UDO, the UDO requires the use of high quality materials, either brick or stone, for the primary building material. The UDO only allows hardy board or fiber cement siding as a secondary material for gables, dormers, and bay windows. EFIS, vinyl, and aluminum siding and untreated wood are not permitted. The UDO requires buildings to maintain 15% window openings or glazing along the primary street. Full compliance with the development standards shall be required when a property is redeveloped or vacant property is developed, when the building square footage is expanded, the expansion shall be in compliance, and when a new structure is built on a lot with multiple structures, the new structure shall be in compliance. Based on site-specific issues, modifications to the standards may be necessary. Minor modifications, deviations of 20% or less, may be approved by Planning Commission's designee or staff. Major modifications, which are deviations of 21% or more, and standards that are non-quantifiable shall be considered by the Planning Commission. In conclusion, staff recommends approval. The UDO is in keeping with the policy and the community's desire to ensure that future development is generally consistent in form and character with the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. And so this uh, item 31 will declare the public hearing open. Um, and so item 31, actually the applicant is the councilman. So councilman, would you like to come up and present or? Thank you. I would, uh no, come on up to the microphone. Or, oh, can't hear you back there. How you doing today? Well, thank you. Um, I, I am I'm, excuse me. I am the applicant. I'm also Nick Leonardo, the council person in District One, uh, but also had uh, most of the residents, probably about 80% of them, sign the application. So I thought I would speak last and go ahead and let those in support uh, speak now, if that was okay. That's fine. That's a good intro. And then what we'll do is we'll ask those supporting it come up, and then they'll get, okay. each get two minutes, and then. Um, those posts will, um, since it's their property, we have traditionally given them five minutes to defend their position since you're the applicant changing, you know, doing the, the UDO. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. So those wishing to speak in 
support go first and then we'll allow the um, that way we treat it the same way so come on up you get two minutes each if you'll state your name and your address in two minutes yes sir mr chairman bobby lewis i live at 4892 clarksville pike um, uh, first thing i want to do is brag on our councilman leonardo i've lived out there a long time He's done more in a few months than we've had out there in several years. So uh, he's worked his tail off. He's talked to a lot of the contiguous owners on the map that are not able to be here. And uh, his voice speaks volumes. I'd ask you to note that uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, I think it's a no brainer, Mr. Chairman um, and committee members. We've got a councilman and uh, the metropolitan government has approved this, uh, but this is not personal, but I've seen this committee when it came to Nashville next, uh, maybe flout the will of the people. And uh, I'm asking to be consistent. When it, back, at, back at that time, uh, the Councilman Hunt and the Metro government was against us. The committee followed their recommendations. Um, this time they coincide with the uh, will of the residents. And I'm asking uh, you to approve the uh, UDO. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up, two minutes. How y'all doing? Uh, my name is Jonathan Lawhorn and uh, I live at 4163 Vesta Road. Um, I spent my life saving on purchasing a farm that I own in Wise Creek because I'm a conservation of wildlife and additionally I'm a conservation of conservationist of history. Uh, Wise Creek is one of the last largely undeveloped metro areas in Davidson County and its uh, beauty lies in its rural nature. Uh, it's, it's also a federally recognized historic area and I believe that the areas that do get developed around there should reflect and fit in with the historical value of Wise Creek. Um, I'm here because I believe that there needs to be the overlay in place to keep people from building modern residences that stick out like sore thumbs. And um, you know, the, the piece of land that is going to be developed is, is right across from, um, from my farm, the road that leads to my farm. And so every day I pull out and I think, man, I'd really love to have bought that farm. And I tried, but I couldn't. And um, <clears throat> so now that it's getting developed, I'd just like to make sure that there's, you know, an overlay in place to, to keep White's Creek's uh, rural nature and beauty intact. And, um, yeah, I just think it's important to, to value the you know the history that's attached to this place and i think that a lot of the people that are in my community and, and my neighbors they all agree that that uh there should be something in place to to keep everything consistent so I, i'm for it thank you thank you good evening my name is kelvin winrow and my address is 3948 lower road that property backs right up to my property uh, i'm not against any development i'm for the udl uh, Lloyd Road is uh, it's a great neighborhood, uh, it's nice homes. Mr. Thompson, I know he's deceased, but that's what he wanted. And he told us that he didn't have any plans to develop that, but, you know, things happen. But uh, if anything do be developed on that property, I just hope it's something that is there and is close to what is there now, because we have a good neighborhood. Everybody keep their homes up. And I just want to say that uh, I support you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Robert Davis, and I live at 3956 Lord Road. And I just stand to say that I am in support of the UDO. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman. Uh, members of the Planning Commission, my name is Stanley Trice, and first of all, I'm going to just read one of the letters that my, my neighbor left. She was here since 4 o'clock. She couldn't stay any longer, so I'm just going to read uh, what she left with me. Uh, it says, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lethia Mann. I live at 3940 Lloyd Road. Thank you for the opportunity to state my support 
of the design overlay for the property borders Old Orchard Subdivision in Whites Creek. I am pleased that the staff recommendation is in support of this request. In 2003, my late husband and I purchased the property. Before we began building our home, we had agreed to 25 restricted covenants concerning lot development. Mr. Thompson had a vision of Whites Creek as an open green space and these covenants preserved that vision. Among the covenants, restriction number two required that each residence have a minimum of 2,500 square feet of living area, exclusive of the garage or basement, and states that all the buildings shall be constructed with brick or stone veneer to grade. Restriction number nine state that all buildings must be 80 feet from Lloyd Road. We built our home according to Mr. Thompson's covenants, and my family and I have lived there on Lord Road for almost 13 years. Over the years, I got to know Mr. Thompson. He was a friendly man who often drove through the neighborhood and loved to stop and talk. He often told me how proud he was of the development in the neighborhood. It was growing, but it was still maintained a rural and intimate feel. On the occasions I talked to Mr. Thompson about the property behind my house, he always stated that he would not sell the land and he did not want it developed. I am baffled as to why this property was excluded from the Nashville Next Plan for Whites Creek, but my neighbors and I are proposing this design overlay in the effort to maintain Mr. Thompson's vision. She has a couple of more paragraphs. If I can continue there, then I've got a few things I'd like to say if possible. Well, uh, why don't you get, how about on the letter, let's go ahead and just give it to the, uh, okay. put it in the record and then if you could just state your things very quickly and we'll. Okay. As I stated, my name is Stanley Trice. My wife. Ms. Ms. Hold on a second, Mr. Chairman. Being that someone uh, as chairman, I thought I was always under the uh, rules that one person spoke with the one speak for the self when they speak for yes. someone else. Yeah, so I'm, I'm asking him to, to conclude his um, summary. He's still under two one, minutes. We, yeah, just 10 seconds, sir. You have to finish up. Oh, so I can't speak for myself. No, I'm in not support not. of the UDO. I live at 3952 Lloyd Road. Thank okay, you. sorry you didn't understand that. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We want to be fair to everybody. Good evening. My name is Thomas Shaw. I live at 3916, 3916 Lord Road. I'm in support of the UDO. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Gladys Herring. My property is at 605 Cherry Grove Point, Weiss Creek. And I stand in support of the UDO in that my property is close to the boundary of this overlay. The overlay will be consistent with the maintenance policies that were adopted for the area under, under the Nashville Next Whites Creek Community Plan. This overlay will help to maintain the character of this built neighborhood designed mostly by the late Mr. William Bill Thompson, from whom my husband and I also purchased our land and had these same type of stipulations on them. The overlay will not take away any homeowner's property rights or change the zoning. We have had several homeowners meetings and there was over help, overwhelming support for the overlay. For all these reasons and many others as been stated by my neighbors, we ask that you will, would please support it and approve the overlay for the area. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, uh, Commission members. My name is Don Majors. I live at 3937 Lloyd Road. Uh, I've been a 13-year resident of Whites Creek and the Lloyd Road area. Uh, There's not a lot that I could add that others haven't already said other than the fact that you've heard a lot about Mr. Thompson. And uh, I bought my lot from him in 2003 also under the same restrictive covenants. And he and I had a really special relationship before he passed on. Uh, I really think that he would, he would be happy with the UDO that's being proposed for this property. Uh, I, n I understand that the heirs to his property um, are probably going to ask for a deferral tonight 
I would respectfully ask that you uh, move forward and approve this UDO. Uh, I've been told that uh, they want to work some things out. Uh, I don't know what they could work out. Uh, basically, the UDO, uh, we've already negotiated down to the point where it is now, and there's still 20% wiggle room for modifications. So uh, I would respectfully urge you to approve uh, this UD UDO tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? So those wishing to speak in opposition, and traditionally, just a clarification so everyone is understanding, is that we usually give, uh, when the councilman uh, changes the property owner zoning or uh, a requirement like a UDO, we give them five minutes. That is tradition. So without objection, we'll do the five minutes, and if that's okay with the commissioners. Okay. That's our tradition, Chairman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Chair, I would five clarify minutes. before I get started, there is specificity in the rules as to organizations for five minutes, and that's what I've sent down here as well, but I appreciate that courtesy. Okay. Uh, and that too. Chairman, members of the uh, commission, my name is Tom White, uh, 315 Dedrick Street, and I represent Jean Thompson, who is the widow and wife of Bill Thompson, who has been so highly accoladed by every single person that's come up here today. Uh, it's absolutely, totally... Uh, they're iconic in the community. They've owned the land that these folks have built their houses on. They've done a first-class job. And in some respects, at this stage, it's like no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, basically, uh, it is not the descendants, it's the widow wife that I'm here representing. Uh, and I'm asking that the matter be uh, either defeated tonight or deferred, and I'll, and I'll cover that in just a moment. As you saw on the property uh, map, which is directly ahead of you, there's 124 acres in total. This, this UDO is directed at nobody but my client. Uh, there are 34 parcels. The other 33 are all built on. It's totally meaningless as to them. Uh, it is an application to my client's property. With respect to negotiations uh, and discussions, we have not had one person come to us to attempt to discuss the UDO provisions. Uh, nobody. And a number of the people that came up here and spoke, I know and I know them well. I, Don Majors has been a friend for 30 years. And no one has come to Gene Thompson to discuss the prospects of this UDO. So although I would say disapprove or defer, I would want it deferred for this reason. I think some of these things make sense. They could be done. They're consistent with my client uh, and her desires on the property. Uh, she's got the same love of the property that her husband, Bill Thompson, did. Now, basically what we've got is there's design standards for the my client's property. Uh, and I'll ask the, the commission to consider tonight there was an earlier matter, it was 5A, Council Lady Mina Johnson was here. When the discussion came up about, uh, in that specific case, about what was being discussed, she said there was a great dialogue between all the property owners. They basically agreed. That's the exact opposite of what we got here. I hope we can get there. I'm pledging to you, if this matter's uh, deferred, I will use my best efforts to get there on some type of resolution. There was discussion that I had with Councilman Leonardo, who's been very candid and open, I've known with him a long time, where the glazing uh, percentage has come down. Other things have been come down. Nobody's negotiated that with us, not one thing. It's been negotiated with the staff. And that's a wonderful thing. Got some great experts on the staff, but at the end of the day, how about the property owner that owns this 100 acres and they didn't buy it in the middle of the night. They've owned it since 1953, 50 plus years. Now, uh, with respect to uh, the current uh, and the reason my client's not here, she would like to be here. She's 88 years old. Hope she's not listening. Uh, she's 88 years old. She's out at Richland Place right now. Uh, she would be here today, but for the fact that within the last 10 days she's fallen. We don't think it's, it's a hip broken, but it's a significant fracture. Uh, or she would be here uh, to discuss just that the matter be deferred. Uh, but I want to urge you, we want to be constructive about this. I'm willing to sit down with, whether it's uh, former Councilman Don Majors, whether it's Nick Leonardo or other folks, we want to see the best thing done for this property, but we ought to have a seat at the table. Uh, you should not come in without some type of dialogue with the main property owner to whom this is directed. Some of the items that are concerned is this. The family is concerned enough, they've hired two engineers and two land use planners. One is Walter Davidson, the other is Roy Dale, to look at the impact of the UDOs and see what that does to the property. It does have some impacts, period. If you're going to require lots in the rear or on the side, you have to have wider lots. If you're going to have brick composition, that may have some limitations. I was told that within the last week, the brick composition, which was to be initially all brick, has now been changed to allow hardy board and other things. 
That's a good change. How about talk to us about it? We think we could get there together as opposed to unilaterally. Uh, but again, I want to stress to you, we want to be totally constructive with respect to our comments. Uh, the other is on the 33 houses, you can see where there are, there's totally disparity in the the price point of the different houses. You might be able to have a UDO where the units that face a certain part may have certain compositions, whereas on the others, they may not. There's all kinds of things that could be done creatively and should be done. Uh, I, I asked the commission to consider this. Uh, Council Molina and I has been very gracious and said, look, Tom, we can take this up at the Metro Council. Uh, and my comment is, that's a legislative body. This is a planning body. This is where issues of design control should be discussed. And so I'm, I'm requesting that the matter uh, be deferred. And I want to make this representation to this commission. I've said it to Councilman Leonardo. I said it to Don Majors. Uh, I'll make an absolute commitment. There's no plan afoot to do anything on this property. And I ask you to think, normally when UDOs come up, what happens? You have a request that includes the property owner. The only property owner here is not included at the table. The second is you usually have a plan afoot. There's no plan. My client doesn't have any plan on the property. I'm committing to the commission that as long as this matter is being considered either here or at the council, we won't submit any plan. We don't intend to submit any one. My client may be 88, but she's very bright, and I'm asking that it be deferred either to March 9 or to March 23. I did speak to, count to uh, James Lawson, former chairman of this group, who lives out there. He can't be here today. He's supportive of the UDO. He has no problem with the deferral, and I Thank urge you to defer it to one of those dates, please. Hello, I'm Linda Thompson Jarrett. I live at 4300 Whites Creek Pike. And I want to thank each and every one of you, Council, and your Council Lady, too. The Commissioners, I know that we're lucky to have your gift of judgment and fairness because you're volunteering. My late father sat in one of those chairs for several years, so I know. I heard. <laughs> okay. I want you to realize this farm you're talking about, you don't see, all you see is from the air. My grandfather bought that. And my aunt and uncle, Bill Thompson, deceased, and my aunt Jean, um, they've, lived, they've been farming in that since I was born. And I'm a senior now. So, and you don't see from this picture, but if you're looking from the street at their house, it's a two-story, pre-Civil War, white columns, white house, wood, with the little white porch with the little railings on it. Metal roof, standing seam metal roof. Barns, barns, and on one side you've got White's Creek, the other side you've got Dry Fork Creek coming together, you've got natural barriers, and you've got creeks. These people behind me are my friends, and most of what they said I agree with. The gentleman on Vesta Road, I'm like, yes, conservation. Uh, Mr. Majors, I mean, and Mr. Lawson, and several of these folks, I could have written what they said. Here's the problem I had no clue that a UDO was being considered for White's Creek. And I didn't talk to my aunt about it because I thought she might get really upset. <laughs> so I've let them tell her. I want you to realize we're willing to work. There is no plan to sell anything. I have no incentive. My house would not be approved. My daughter's and son-in-law next door would not be approved to fit on this. And I live like on the other end of this farm, my grandparents' farm. We wouldn't even be allowed to put my house in her house there, her new one. So there's plenty of room to work together because all of my neighbors, we have much more in common than we have disagreement. I just see this as something that just came up and it's attacked us and restricts us with degrading restrictions. I would prefer something grander than what those restrictions said. Thank you. Thank you. State your name and your address in two minutes. Yes, uh, my name is Steve Huff. I own property at 501 Cherry Grove Lane in Whites Creek. And uh, I was going to say good afternoon, but it's now good evening, <laughs> planning commissioners. Uh, additionally, you need to know that my aunt is Jean Thompson, and my uncle that people have spoke so highly of was Bill Thompson. And Bill was responsible for developing this area. Uh, my aunt owns the property that's going to be impacted or most impacted by this UDO. I want to speak in opposition uh, to this UDO request in its current form. Uh, at the top of the list, the only effective, effective property owner is Jean Thompson. She has not been contacted directly about this proposed overlay. The 101 acres that she owns, she's lived on for 60 plus years, is now the target of this UDO that she didn't initiate. Uh, and although you've heard she's in a nursing home, she still gets her mail. She still has a phone that she answers. She has not been contacted. Although there are no plans to sell this property, to develop this property, 
Uh, fortunately, other family members did hear about the situation. We initiated engineering studies. Uh, we've got those initiated to try to determine the effects of what's going on uh, with this UDO, how it would affect the property in the future. But we don't know if we should support it as it exists. Should we object to it? Should we ask for changes? We just don't know without proper time for this to be thoroughly studied uh, by the experts, and they need to advise us. So <clears throat> given that the property owner has not had the opportunity for study on this UDO or enough opportunity, um, I, I think approval of this would certainly send us a rather chilling note to uh, Davidson County property owners and future developers, and the message might read, the future of your properties can be shaped without your input. So for these reasons, um, until the principal property owner is given adequate time to study this, if you can't defer this vote, and I might suggest that, I suggest that you, re you reject this proposal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, my name's David Huff, 1111 Holly Street. <clears throat> I'm a nephew also of Gene Thompson. My comments uh, are gonna be a little different, uh, but there has been a lot of angst, frankly, with regard to this matter and how, frankly, I feel my aunt's being treated. <clears throat> Listen to my comments, please, and you decide. We decided to dictate how your property will be, develop, will be developed. We are mostly your neighbors if it is ever developed. Contrary to normal practice, we were able to file a UDO for your property without your signature, without any existing plans, without having to pay the normal $2,800 $2, fee, and we didn't even have to present it to you for consideration. We just told planning what we wanted, they drew it up and agreed to support it. Yes, we have decided perhaps years in advance of any possible development, how high and wide houses will be, that crawl spaces will be required, where garages should be constructed. We will require you to use all brick on houses over the entire acreage, even though all of your houses, our houses are not all brick, and even though your historic 1850 house is all wood shingle. Heck, we even determined how many windows you must and how deep porches must be. Well, I think that covers it. Oh, by the way, sorry you had to hire a lawyer again to protect your property rights. But as you can see, our desire as neighbors supersedes your property rights. And since you're 88, why do you care? Your Honor, uh, members of the commission, I'm used to say your honor, Th this is serious business. Our aunt has not been given any uh, 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 consideration here and this should be deferred so consideration can be given to a plan that is convenient, that is suitable for all involved, particularly the property owner. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? All right, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, committee. I appreciate your service to the city and I appreciate your time. Um, and as I said, Mr. Lawson couldn't be here tonight. He's suffering from the flu, but he is in support. Um, spoke with him today. Uh, and I think it's, it's very germane to go back and look at the history of, of how and where we find ourselves uh, tonight. Uh, this particular track, this was track four of the 11 tracks that it took this body uh, working diligently about four years. I bet you hoped you never hear the word Wrights Creek so soon and we'd be back here. Um, but uh, even long before I was a council person, we would go to the Nashville Next meetings and we had them in Alex Green School. And everyone in there, uh, and Mr. Lawson conducted the meetings, uh, was for T2, and that was it. And at the time, T3 neighborhood maintenance was never even an option. That was something that was created later as Nashville Next evolved. And if the community's wishes, that being that it was unanimously for T2, then the, then the rural subdivision regs would apply. And we wouldn't be here tonight if we had that. Um, and this process with this UDO began uh, long before I was elected, and, and uh, actually uh, Deputy Director Mr. Lieber, being the dedicated public servant that he is, uh, actually had worked with uh, one of the members who spoke tonight uh, and, and approached me uh, with some ideas that they had been working on, because uh, this has been going on uh, for quite some time. Uh, when, when I became the council person, um, well, before I became council person, Council Lady Hurt had meetings about this UDO, which was six, seven, eight months ago. Uh, and in addition, I have had uh, at least two, if not three meetings uh, that were open to the public. And as I'm a lawyer and as an officer of the court, 
I must tell you that I have personally spoken to Ms. Jarrett and Mr. David Huff, who's also a lawyer, and they have personally attended our meetings about everything that was discussed, and at no time did anyone raise an objection. No, no the councilman's speaking, so let's we gotta keep it down. At no time did anyone raise an objection, and when I saw David, I know him as a lawyer, I said, Mr. Huff, you're here, he said, yes, uh, the council office did a mailer, and that is uh, to my aunt, Ms. Thompson, and that's how we knew that you were having this meeting. And so we've had discussions, and I've reached out and personally have talked to, to Mr. Huff and Ms. Jarrett, and they both have always maintained they have no plans for the property, and, that, and that's true. Uh, but I want it to be very, very clear that this is not somehow, I mean, if I wanted to, if, you're, if a district council person wanted to come in here and rezone this, that's what, if we wanted to do that, that's what we could have done. We didn't do that. We're utilizing the UDO, an overlay that was, you know, by this commission, and we went to great lengths to make sure that we could have a recommendation by the staff for approval, and we went and worked on the height, we worked on the glazing uh, and the like. And as you all know, and it's already been stated, we're not taking any entitlements away from anyone here. Uh, we're not changing zoning. Uh, you know, they're still allowed, they still have their T3 neighborhood maintenance where they can have 269 units if they want. They wanna go in and do a subdivision, they can do that too. That's not gonna change any of this. They have this relief you know, valve on this uh, minor modifications that the planning department or, or staff a representative could approve if it was less than 20%. And I think it's important to, sh to note too that Clarksville Pike is widening, okay, in the Bordeaux area. And the funds have been approved. It's going to five lanes all the way to Briley Parkway, which is probably less than a mile from this area. And so this neighborhood uh, is, is gonna be a wonderful transition neighborhood between the urban services district and the general services district, which you get a little bit further. And so all we were trying to do is to ensure that we had uh, design standards uh, that would make sure that it respects the, the unique qualities of the neighborhood. And I would also say that the, um, it's consistent with the T3 policy uh, because the standards uh, are, are um, consistent with the suburban residential neighborhood design. Um, we see overlays in here all the time. I was in here not too long ago on a contextual overlay. You have lots of people for, Lots of people against. It just depends on how many folks are there that night. But I don't know that I've ever seen a time when one person, uh, you know, a decision was made because one person was against a particular overlay. That happens in here on a regular basis. If you look at the paper the last week, you start to notice that all you see in the paper is these overtures about council people uh, caving to big developers and, and, and trying to, to do what the developers want. Well, tonight I'm here doing what the residents want. And I think we have almost all 34 except uh, Ms. Thompson because I've, I've never spoken to Ms. Thompson and I've, I've spoke to her late husband, but, um, and, that's, and that's an oddity as well. So we would ask for your approval and as far as the delay goes, I did agree and I will agree here today uh, that uh, if second reading comes up and they don't have their engineering stuff together, then I'll defer it until they get this engineering stuff together. But this is the first I heard of this engineering stuff was two days ago. Uh, Mr. Huff has been here for every bit of these Nashville Next meetings on these, on these particular tracks of the property. Uh, Mr. White's been with him and so, and I've worked with Mr. White, we have a good working relationship and, uh, and I'm willing to work with him, but this has been in the works for a long time and I don't see any need with a recommendation for approval, especially as an officer of the court, I'm telling you that they have been involved. And, they have, and we have tried to work with them and they have come to the meetings. And so I would ask that, uh, that we go ahead and, and pass this today and move it forward to the council. And if there is anything that they would like to do, um, you know, or like to be heard on on the second reading and their engineering designs aren't there, uh, then we'll move forward. But I have a feel, and it's not just a one meeting delay. This is, this is 60 days. And I mean, anything can happen. They could come in with a subdivision in within 60 days and that's their right to do that with these new state laws that we have about pending legislation. So I appreciate your time, but I don't want you to think that we didn't conduct meetings and that I have not reached out to them. I am not that kind of person. Uh, and at this point in time, those folks don't even own this property yet. So I would ask for your approval and I appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no other one wish to speak, I'd play the public hearing closed. Chairman, you wanna start us off? First, I'd like to get a clarification. I don't hear as well as I did few years ago, but I'm conflicted as to whether these people were notified or not. Uh, I thought I understood and maybe an error that, uh, I'm asking them, please, if you'd mind, um, 
Did y'all state that you were not notified? I have participated in Would you come to the microphone yeah. so I could hear you? I, I don't exactly know what he's talking about. Maybe I can clarify. I have attended every Nashville Next that I was able to get to due to I'm family health. I'm not talking health. about Nashville Next. I'm talking about... This particular thing? I, I don't remember ever no, being... No, speak, speak to me I don't so I can hear I remember you. being in a room with my neighbors discussing a UDO. Okay. Okay. Oh. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Ms. Jarrett lives in District 3, and so she would You'll not get noticed, and she's not a property owner, so she wouldn't get noticed. But uh, Mr. Huff and, and her, uh, the other gentleman both have been at our meetings, but they wouldn't have gotten noticed because they're not within okay. the, okay. the district. Well, okay, thank, thank you. I'm thank not you. in the same district. Can okay. you all sit down, please? Yeah, thank, thank you, you both. Uh, thank you. This is not much different than the property rights that we discussed at last meeting. Uh, People have owned this for 63 years. Um, they didn't buy it to flip it. Uh, they don't have a plan to move forward, so I don't know that there's a uh, any any date that we need to. You know, there's we could defer it. I mean, they, there's not a plan that'd have to come before us before it went to to the council, and that's there's none before us and. Um, it just, you know, the, she's owned it for 63 years, and it reminds me, I went to a meeting, I had a um, parcel I wanted to get approved, this about 20 years ago in Antioch, and Council Lady at the time had my meeting, and the same meeting going on at the same time, and this elderly gentleman got up that was probably 75, 80 years old, maybe even older, that had lived in that neighborhood for, owned property maybe 50 plus years, many subdivisions right around him, he was trying to get his approved, they didn't want to prove because it's going to bring traffic. He got up and he said, you came, you came, you came. I didn't oppose you. So these people have owned this for all this time. Reese Thompson, Bill's brother, had a dairy farm. They're the one that set the tone of this community. So they ought to have some right to sit down and negotiate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Agadu. Um, so I have a question regarding, because I'm not as familiar with UDOs, if this, so say if we didn't have a UDO here and this was to be developed, right, and come back before us, I know there would be subdivision regulations that would apply if, we, if they tried to do the lots. Explain to me what kind of, because um, I live in White's Creek. And I will tell you that I am a huge proponent of design overlays because I have seen some terrible, ugly, awful, not inexpensive developments done for the sake of selling houses out in our neighborhood. So, in a former Edgefield resident, I'm a huge fan of, of some, some sort of guidelines to help us keep the character of our community. and. Um, there is a character to this property with the, the currently the current uh, pieces. I don't know if brick being required is necessary. Um, so I guess my question is, if we don't have an urban, this this contextual overlay, and there's a subdivision plan that comes before us, what are our well, I, I think it's important to remember in Jessica's presentation, she had that slide about how if if um, somebody brings forward a subdivision plat, it still follows all those same processes. So whether it's a full-size lot subdivision or whether it's a cluster lot subdivision, there would still be a process. They'd have to submit for the concept plan. There would be a public hearing. And then these standards really kick in when somebody's applying for a building permit at the end of the process. Right. So they design a subdivision and then knowing that if they're going to build the subdivision, they're going to have to comply with these these standards. Mm -hmm. If these standards aren't here, we don't have. They would just bring us. It would be the subject to the base zoning, which are just kind of you know the setbacks and the no height. design standards, right? Just come in and look like it, what, you know uh, kind of get to here. I mean, you could argue there are some design standards built into our base zoning, like mm -hmm. the setbacks, like the overall height. I mean, those are still there, but nothing beyond that. Okay. Um, I'm gonna listen. Okay. Um, it, it seems like this is um, 
um, you know, consistent with the plan. Um, it's, um, it's not a zone change. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of like uh, getting ahead of making sure that it, what we're just planning to do, what the national next kind of all that work that went into it. So, uh, so I'm basically supportive of going forward with it. It seems like there was a lot of thought went into it, and it's not. Like not a zone change, like you say, everything will still have to get uh, brought before any kind of subdivision. So. Council lady, thank you. Um, I, I want to, I guess, go back to a pending legislation was mentioned. That's always a complicated question, based on sort of the the timing of things that might need to happen. If there were to be a one meeting deferral, which I, I realize can kind of start a cascade so that everyone can feel like they're caught up in the in the discussion. Um, what could potentially happen in whatever the cascading delay is that would potentially get ahead of, of UDO guidelines? I mean, to me, it sounds uh, the like- The first question I've got to ask staff is, is there a bill filed? No. Okay, there's no bill filed. Um, no then, uh, no. Pending legislation doctrine doesn't take effect until this body gives a recommendation back to the council and that it is, and that the uh, legislation is then properly pending before them. They've received all the recommendations. And the bill is filed. And the bill is filed, right, because it doesn't mean anything <laughs> until the bill is filed, right. Um, if you defer this, then, um, then it will just simply delay that until after that recommendation gets back to the council and the bill is filed. And that's when pending legislation would begin to apply. Okay. That's, that's I, I, you know, I, I mean, to me, it sounds like some good discussion has happened. Some people, for whatever reasons, feel like they've been left out of it that, that perhaps need to be in that discussion. Um, and it's always, it's always nice when something goes through and everybody has reached consensus, which is not always easy to do. But it, to me, it sounds like the potential may be here, and I hope I'm not making my my colleague grumpy with me over there. I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. Um, and so I'm just trying to, to think through, is, is there, is there risk to jeopardizing what the neighbors of the other 33 properties have worked hard for by allowing further conversation with regard to anybody jumping in and anything happening? It doesn't seem likely. I'm just, I want to. Well, 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 let me say this, uh, that to no, maybe give everybody comfort on this on this particular issue. Uh, I mean, there's always that concern, and the, and the state legislature did change the when uh, properties vest, which now create uh, a heightened awareness of pending legislation doctrine. But the pending legislation doctrine still doesn't actually. Uh, no one can um, sort of beat that timeline, the pending legislation doctrine, until they've received a approval of their plan. It's not just a submittal of their application, mm -hmm. but it's an approval, a plan that's been approved, that's when they vest, right? And so they get the, once they've got the approved plan and they're vested uh, before the pending legislation doctrine comes into effect, then they're vested. Okay. But, I feel comfortable saying uh, that there are no plans that could be uh, approved through Metro's process in 30 days uh, to the degree that gives anybody comfort. Because you may be working on other things. Because okay. we may have a couple other plans that have been filed uh, okay. recently. Maybe um, like 85 or so. Okay, that's helpful, that's helpful. Um, I mean, it, it certainly seems to me like you know this has been a continuation of the next initial next process, and I you know I am well aware of how much um, time and effort and, and uh, just soul searching has gone into um, the, all the neighbors working to to protect White's Creek, which they all feel passionately about. What a wonderful place it is, and I, I get that. So I, I definitely want to keep the train rolling, um, but it sure would be great if it could roll with with everybody's blessing. So I just want to hear what the rest of the folks have to say. Mr. Diaz. Thank you. Um, I agree. I know that UDOs are very hard to, um, as a community, agree on. I know that it's, I'm very familiar with the process that it takes to get to this point. And I think that with this momentum going and um, knowing that the 
idea and the concept, everybody agrees with the, you know, trying to protect the character of this area. I think everybody's on the same page. Um, unfortunately, miscommunication, you know, I just think it's, it's not fair to approve this without someone that has the large majority of the property not being able to at least have a little bit of feedback or be there at the meeting. Um, I know that everybody gets a public, like uh, a notification through the mail. Every property owner does. I think that's part of the, like, you know, policy for planning. But I think that you know they still deserve to be there and part, you know, participate. So, um, I just wanted to ask: Is there a possibility that? Or what would it, what the process look like if we deferred it and closed the public hearing? Like, what would that threaten anything, or like, what does that look like? Mr. Director, uh, um, as I stated, I don't think that I feel confident in saying that you that no property owner could get a permit through the process in 30 days. So to the degree that it threatens something, uh, to the degree that it leaves a window open, that 30 days would leave an in, a window open that would undermine this legislation by allowing uh, a plan to be approved, I don't think that's possible. Um, and, you know, what we would do is we would continue to work with the councilman. The councilman's been very open to working with us. The, the, there was a legislation that was filed, or not legislation filed, there was legislation that was presented to us for the UDO, and we had uh, staff uh, and myself, we had a number of issues with what was originally filed, um, and the, the neighbors that, that we've had communications with, and, and the councilman in particular, was very open to all those discussions. I, I don't think at any point that anybody that we've had communication with has been real hard-lined about any of it. Uh, so uh, what I would say is that we would make ourselves available to the councilman, uh, as I'm sure he'd probably reach out to the knowing him, reach out again to uh, the property owners, and we'd work with them. Uh, that's what that would look like, and we would make ourselves available. Um, if I met, well, okay, so that part of deferral I understand, but if um, I said, um, if I made a motion to defer it and make the next um, public hearing closed because we already had an open public hearing, what is, does that just mean that it would go through administrative, administrative approval or no. consent? No, it's got to come back here. Oh, it has to. Yeah, okay. the, 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 the question about the, the public uh, hearing yeah. is just uh, whether you want to take testimony at the next hearing or not. And, okay. You know, you, you've, you've heard from both sides at this point. It's just whether after we have further meetings, whether you want to have another public hearing where both sides speak again or not. That's all that will, will affect. And if that is what you want, at, is that in 30 days when you have it come back or Mm -hmm. We'll just say at uh, uh, two meeting deferral when it comes back uh, that you would just say, and then we're going to reopen the hearing for that meeting, and then we would just have hear testimony at that time. Okay. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, well, I don't have too much more to add um, than what was otherwise said. So it's not a zone change. It doesn't really seem like anyone is particularly against, even the family is particularly against. Um, what the UDO requirements are, just want a chance to look at them more. Um, I think the councilman's open to the family having the engineer um, and the studies and having and continuing the conversation. And he offered perhaps the possibility of, um, I guess, just deferring maybe the second reading or so. If so, if, for example, say the family had a chance to have the engineer come back with studies and um, wanted to give testimony again, but we approved it here, they would have a chance to testify before council. I guess, how does that work, the council process? Yes, so if, uh, if this body were to go ahead and approve it, mm -hmm. and it started to move forward in the legislative process at council, uh, it is a zone bill, a zoning bill, so it can be amended all the way through third reading. The only caveat to that that I would say is that if there was a substantive change to the UDO, if it was materially altered in some way, that 
this body hadn't really considered some element there that, that we felt was material, then it might have to come back at that time. Um, but otherwise, it could be amended at the council and then move forward there. Well, I guess I have a question for the councilman. I guess there's a possibility that if you continue the conversation, which you've committed to doing, that there could be possibly a substantive change made to the UDO, in which case it would need to come back here. So, I mean, would you, I mean, I guess maybe would you, not to put words in your mouth, would it be easier for us to just defer it at this level to have a chance to kind of work all those things out or would you still prefer to move forward with the UDO as it stands now with the possibility that some large changes need to be made and it have to come back to the commission? Uh, Commissioner Blackshear, I'm, I'm completely open to, um, I mean, I, as far as tonight, it would be great if it could be approved because we've worked very hard on this. And like I've said, the, uh, you know, I've, I've had conversations with each one of these people as recently as this week, both of them came to a, a UDO meeting in Bordeaux and we talked about the White's Creek issue with some of the members of the planning department even present. Uh, so uh, we're open and if there is a substantive change, obviously we would have to re-refer back to planning and we're open to, to those negotiations as well, but uh, to just stop here and wait 60 days at this point uh, with the work that we put in, it just seems like it's, uh, you know, be more just an unnecessary delay. But I am committed to continue to work with them and, and, and we've, we've shown that as, uh, as Director Sloan has said. So if there's a possibility that that is a substantive change, we'll come back. Otherwise, I'm committed to working with them and I have been working with them, so thank you. Well, I would say um, and it's not a zone change. I do think it's a good idea and it doesn't sound like the family thinks that it's a particularly bad idea. They just want an opportunity to kind of vet it more. And I, I don't, I think either way, whether we defer it or approve it, I think the family's gonna have the opportunity to um, have that vetting process. So um, I am, as it stands now, um, in favor of this bill. Um, or in favor of this proposal, and the question would be, when does the vetting process occur? Does it occur now, or does it occur at the council stage? Commissioner Clifton. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I have been confused by this, um, and, and confused about how much you guys knew when, and, um, and it seems like smart folks and good folks that I know here <laughs> and have for many years on both sides of this, um, to me, um, I have become aware, and this hasn't always been the case, but as complicated as Nashville land use can get lately, I, I really, um, w when a developer is coming to the commission with something and, and there are people in the neighborhood who, who haven't actually been fully involved in it, with, whether they could have been or not, and it's complicated and it's gonna affect the rest of their lives, you know, I'm, I'm very inclined to defer those things the first time it comes here. Um, whether, I think, whether I think it's a good plan or a bad plan, if, if someone wants to have more input and it's a complicated situation, then I'm, I tend to wanna give them more time. And, um, and I, so, so what I can't quite figure out is um, the disparity between the groups thinking how much the other side should have known what's going on. <laughs> um, and it's, it's confusing to me. Um, and I suspect that, um, uh, that the parties, the, the, the two, two sides, since they're obviously sides here, <laughs> uh, physically uh, uh, separated by the aisle, uh, I suspect they they can probably come to tremendous con consensus um, on this. All of which is to say, even though I have a great deal of respect for um, all these folks, and I've, while I don't know the new council member, I have heard amazing things about him, and I'm proud he's there. Uh, I'm unprepared to vote for this today. Um, I, I see nothing particularly wrong with it, except I think bending over backwards to make sure that people feel invested, particularly owners. So I would be inclined to support. I don't think I'm here ready to support a two month deferral. I think 
I might be inclined to support a motion for a 30 day to for whatever that meeting would be. Two, two, meetings. two meetings. That's where I am right now. I could be persuaded, perhaps. My sure. Um, can you guys tell me just a little bit? I know I had this let, this discussion about UDS at the last meeting, but so what's the process? Like, how did how did we come up with the design criteria for the for the UDO? So for this one, um, this was come up. The standards were developed by the local community, and then they submitted them to us and we reviewed them and provided feedback. So some UDOs, we come up with the standards, but on this one, the community came up with the standards and we provided the feedback. And you feel that the standards that have come up are consistent with the um, existing character of that community? Yes, yes. I feel like uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, let me say that that, what? that didn't just happen overnight. No, I know. Uh, there, I was a, there was a lot of work uh, between what was submitted to us and then research was done with staff about the existing structures that are included because it's not just one parcel. As right. you can see on the map, there's quite a number of parcels. And uh, we wanted to make sure that this UDO wasn't creating, wasn't making every structure out there a non-conforming uh, lot or, or structure, right. uh, which is well, a lot of the height and uh, glazing requirements and a lot of other elements that, that uh, were in the original UDO were changed uh, to, to make it so that really what we had was a UDO that was trying to create harmonious development that matched a lot of the housing types that were already included. And so only then did we get to a place where we were comfortable uh, recommending <coughs> approval of the UDO. Okay, and then I guess one other process related question. Um, we don't have a requirement of a certain number of property owners signing off before we go forward with anything. I mean, there's no requirements like that. Nope, not a popularity okay. contest. Yeah, that's, I didn't think so. Um, I mean, I have to say, I really like this plan. I think that um, I really like this approach to trying to preserve the character of a community. I think we, as you guys know, spent a long time talking about how to preserve the rural character of White's Creek. Um, the number of lots that can be developed has not been changed. It's just saying that you know, what gets developed is going to be consistent with what's actually out there in the community already, which, you know, we know the community felt very strongly about trying to preserve that, that sense of community, that sense of character. I mean, I can only speak for myself as a prospective homeowner, but I also think that I would be much more inclined to go to a community knowing that the character has got, you know, there are these steps in place to preserve that character. That's why people are moving to White's Creek, because that's what they want. Um, so I think, you know, knowing the time and the energy that's gone into that, seeing the support from the, the general community and then having listened through the entire Nashville Next process, I feel like this is very consistent with what the community would want. And so I'm inclined to support staff's recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah just the, um, I think both sides agree that there should be a UDO there. It's just a matter of how you get there. And I think the lack of communication has probably stung some people. Um, but um, one thing that was glaring to me when we talked about, you know, the uh, structure, earlier we talked about the glazing of being 20, I think 25 percent, and then this one it said 15 percent, but yet we hadn't really established what that glazing should be. So. I think in all fairness to both sides, I'm going to make a motion that we defer two meetings, but reopen, to leave the public hearing open so everybody that came in opposition or for has that opportunity to restate their position after they've hopefully agreed on something. Maybe when they come back, it's on consent, hopefully it would be. But my motion is to, um, to defer two meetings. And that's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. And second. I do have a question before you. We are on discussion. Commissioner Clifton. Tell me if this is improper, but I'd like to ask the chair to clarify with uh, with Mr. White or others over here that that they're on board with the idea that even though we've heard it explained that there's really very little that can be done to stop this, that, that to undercut this process, and that you don't want to do that. I would, would it be an appropriate question to ask if, if we have your, your commitment that you will stop what, that you're not going to do anything until further discussions 
before this body. Absolutely, and I said that as I've just been that. there for 63 years. I'm repeating again, there's absolutely no plans. Nobody could ever conceive that there's any kind of thing we could do that could possibly come back here in less than 30 days. And I've said this to the councilman, I'm saying this to you because you've raised the issue of dialogue. We have not attended one of the meetings with the staff. The staff has been very creative. I think they've come up with some great ideas. We haven't attended any of those. Right. We're just asking for that opportunity and a full commitment, right. not just to stay in good faith, but to hopefully get back here and have a UDO that's on the consent agenda. That's what we're trying to get. All right. That's what I thought you had said already. Right. I just want to clarify. Any other discussion? All in favor of a two-meeting deferral say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. All right, let's do hands. So all in favor of the 30th day deferral, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Noes? Five to four, and it's deferred two meetings. And we are on other business. For the record, uh, because there's a lot of discussion in the public... And the public hearing will be open back up. Yeah, okay. That was part of the motion. Okay. That was part of the motion. Right. Come back. It's okay. We'll hear it. So we are on other business, historic. You know, with our music row, I just wanted to say we ha we do have a national register national register eligible <coughs> property that's on a 90 day um, um, hold because of potential demolition that we did a couple weeks ago, 823 19th Avenue South, which is Studio 20, um, since we all talked a whole lot about Music Row and what's going on with that. Um, and also on February 10th, um, African American History and Culture Conference, um, which is something else that we support. Thank you. That's it. Mission. Perfect. Parks. Nothing, no report from Parks. Executive Committee. We don't have a a report, um, although I would like to just say one thing. I, I've asked Doug um, to, to potentially look at our rules to make sure that the property owner has five minutes to speak. We've traditionally done that, but it's not in our rules, so I want him to look at that, um, and we'll get back to y'all. To be clear, it's when, when the property owner's not uh, the applicant. The applicant. Well, I'll work on that because I understand the intent of it. Uh, what I don't want to have happen is that we do, say, UDO that uh, covers 100 lots and the councilman's the uh, sponsor, so then we have 500 minutes that we would open. So I'll figure out a way to work. I think I understand what you want to accomplish, uh, Chairman. But yeah, and, and the reason for it, which is important to me, is that every it's a, it has to be a written rule. You know, yes, we do a lot of things traditionally, but if we want to make sure that everybody has a copy of those rules and can read those and can can't the um, chairman though have some discretion on something like that like we do this was a specific this was a special circumstance that you which you use but instead of making it a um, you know like you said it could open up well by the ordinance I'm an own owner so you have like you said you could have 100 people yeah I would say we leave it to the chairman of the well let's well, let's have Doug look at it that's why I want to just bring it up to y'all that spoken like a chairman yeah. we 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 want to um, make sure that it's fair and we don't want to I know that y'all don't want to be here for five 500 minutes uh, or whatever so we we'll add it to Doug's Doug's things to do I know he's probably I'll give it to Sean she's not doing anything okay good <laughs> anything else vice chair or on executive committee okay uh, director report anything uh, yeah. no nothing at uh, 830 no and uh, legislatively wise how are we doing council um, <laughs> I'll just throw out there was a meeting a joint meeting of the um, Planning Committee, Codes Committee, and Convention Committee to talk about short-term rental, which has been a hot topic lately. Um, and they, it, it was, it was a good discussion of sort of how to how to incorporate some uh, good recommendations from an out outside consultant with regard to enforcement of that. And there will probably be more bills coming up on that. I know y'all have gotten a lot of emails regarding that, even though it's not currently on our agenda. But um, 
I, I think we'll be seeing some things coming up. Thank you, Council Lady. Is there a motion to adjourn? Or adjourn? This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.